Anna for hosting uh, this meeting in the framework of the ICOG initiative. And uh, let me share my screen as well because I will um, introduce you a bit to this meeting today. Um, can you all see my screen? I suppose so. Okay, just a moment. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. It, it will come, I suppose. Oh. Well, there is just a message saying Katerina passed the... Yeah. Okay, now we have Yeah. Yes, you have it now. Okay. <coughs> Perfect. So let me go directly to the... Sharing mode. Okay. So uh, we named uh, this uh, workshop the Poetical Reloaded uh, Workshop. Uh, on challenges and way forward in cognitive architecture. So for those of uh, uh, who are here, Katerina. yes. Katerina, sorry, yeah. uh, you yeah. have the presenter view. So you're share we also see the, the next slide and the notes and everything. Um, okay. So okay. when you share okay. from me. PowerPoint, you can check that you're not uh, using the presenter mode. Okay, just a moment. Uh -huh. uh, Let me do it again. <coughs> Takes me back again to the presenter's mode, but we'll get it. We'll get there. Sorry for that. Okay, there you have under automatic use presenter view. You ju just need to make sure to have it ticked off on the toolbar. Um, on the toolbar of slideshow towards the end, there is. Yes, it just the, the zoom controls that. Uh... Okay. Um... Uh, okay, maybe in setup, try. Yes, thank you. Um, don't, no, monitors. Ah, uh, yes, here it is. Okay, okay. there we, we go. found it. Yeah, <laughs> Thanks. it's perfect. Okay, thank you. Ah, I think that is fine, right? Yes. Perfect, okay. So, the uh, practical reloaded workshop. Uh, we called it a practical reloaded because, as you will see, all of the speakers today uh, have participated in the Poeticon uh, projects. So I will take you briefly through, um, I will remind you of the uh, Poeticon projects and, uh, and then uh, I will explain what to, to expect from uh, today's uh, presentations and how Poeticon is related to the topic of uh, cognitive architectures. Um, so let's remember for a minute uh, a few things about practicums. Is there sound on this, Katerina? Yes, you can hear it. We, we cannot hear the sound. You cannot hear Maybe, the sound. Uh, 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 where it says uh, share, you can click it says share with sound. Oh. Anyway. It doesn't matter. It's um, the sound is not very important. Yeah, it's just music. There's not something that we say. I will take you through the, the information. Okay. Okay. And again. <laughs> okay. So, oh no, stop, I stopped again. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
Okay. So the Predicon projects were two European funded uh, projects. Uh, they started in 2008 and we actually finished back in 2016. It's been some time since. Um, they focused on cognitive robotic applications and uh, the main uh, topic involved how many emerges in um, uh, sensory motor um, uh, experiences, in verbal interaction, in everyday interaction, in other ways. Um, it was an interdisciplinary set of projects. Uh, so as you will see today from the speakers we have invited, um, we had colleagues from neuroscience, from linguistics, computer science, uh, robotics, uh, cognitive psychology, and so on, who participated in both uh, projects. And actually, it's an, it was an international consortium, mainly uh, comprising uh, European countries, uh, Greece, Italy, Portugal, uh, but also um, we had a participant from the US, which was uh, Yanis, uh, Jan Salimunos in Maryland. Um, in these projects, we focused on two robotic applications. One was um, uh, related to verbal human robot interaction, how a robot can actually uh, get a verbal instruction and uh, understand what it says and uh, do something to perform a task. And the other one was visual understanding. We had the robot, we had the ICA platform, um, watching a human doing everyday actions and, uh, and describing verbally uh, what was going on in the scene. Um, and um, we developed a wide range of um, modules, uh, of um, processes, uh, which were fully integrated in the practical cognitive architecture. So we had language processing tools, object recognition, uh, action recognition, action effect recognition. Here you can see a very detailed list, I will go through it. Um, but uh, also from the talks that we host today, we will realize uh, the wide range of um, technologies that were developed, but also the basic um, research that took place within Poeticons, especially the experimental uh, neuroscientific work, uh, which fed all computational uh, work in the, in the project. Um, you can find online in the Poeticons site uh, extensive details on what was developed and uh, on those uh, modules, on, the, on that code that has been uh, provided open source to the research community. Um, code, data sets, and many, many publications. Here are just a, a few images of um, related to output from the project, the Praxicon, the Minimalist Grammar of Action, a big data set on affordances, you name it. And um, just a list of, of some tangible outputs uh, related to dissemination as well, publications and so on. I think this is the first time that I have put everything together uh, in the list, I mean, publications that were um, done in both projects. Uh, so I, uh, today was the first time that I see myself the total number of um, publications, for example, or invited talks um, generated uh, by the project. Um, a lot of work, lots of interaction between um, all these different groups that uh, were involved. And here's a very brief um, uh, figure of the practical cognitive architecture. I won't go in, into detail because we will hear later on uh, in one of the talks uh, a few more things about it. But keep in mind that we had uh, language modules, visual modules, visual processing modules, um, a, a robotic platform that was moving and it was doing things um, uh, fully working uh, in specific demonstration scenarios. And we also had um, reasoning modules, uh, planning modules, and so on. So this, is, this was not, of course, a complete cognitive arch architecture, but uh, we had developed and we had integrated some very basic components uh, for cognitive architecture. So, why we have the meeting today, what, uh, what you should expect from today's meeting. Um, in the talks that uh, will follow, uh, you will hear about lessons learned in these two projects. As I said, we have the chance uh, to, uh, to bring together very groups from different disciplines with diverse background, and we have the chance to build a common language with with each other. And this was, I think this was one of the most basic things that was achieved uh, within Platicon. 
so you will hear lessons learned in the Predicon projects with regard to cognitive architectures. Uh, you will hear, of course, about the uh, latest related research that has been uh, uh, done uh, by the corresponding uh, research, research groups. And you will also hear um, the perspectives on the way forward that um, some uh, PIs uh, would like to, to wear today. So all or some of these things will be heard in today's talks. And um, here's our brief agenda that we will try to stick to, if possible. Um, as always, as we used to do in our meetings, uh, we will give the floor first to the new scientists uh, of the group, because we always believe that they will give us the, the, basic, uh, the basis on which we can build. They always uh, gave us information on how the brain works, and all our discussions and uh, our debates um, shared this, um, uh, this basic uh, perspective that uh, we will try to uh, get ideas or to get uh, some directions from how the human brain works and um, include this uh, in whatever we develop uh, computationally. So the floor goes to Luciano Vatica and Alessandro De Rosilio. Uh, I will stop sharing now and our colleagues uh, can uh, take the floor okay <clears throat> thank you very much the idea is that uh, so first of all uh, ciao to everybody i'm very happy to be with you particularly because this is the first talk i give uh, uh, on streaming the, the unique talk i accepted to give uh, online because i refused during these two years uh, of uh, science fiction situation <laughs> so i hate the situation in which i don't have real persons in front of me there is no interaction probably because uh, of one of the reasons this is one of the reasons i will become clearer after uh, our discussion today we need the interaction and uh, first of all i have to share the screen and to share the screen i have first to start with uh, okay I think it's a, 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 this one. Can you can you see? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the title is a little bit generic. The the idea is that I give it an introduction, which uh, maybe is a little bit philosophical, and then Alessandro will go more in depth into into scientific uh, achievements and so on uh, that uh, are relevant uh, for, 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 for us uh, and we achieve it after the, the end of Poetico. But uh, I consider, from my perspective, important to give this philosophical framework because uh, there are people connected who never uh, were never present uh, at our meetings. So in my view, is important. They would like to start with the, with the picture is a tribute to our Greek, uh, uh, Greek friends. That is the, a, a famous painting by Raffaello Sanzio, is a, is a fresco the, which is conserved at the Vatican, showing uh, what Raffaello called the school of Athens. So the school of philosophy, which uh, we can consider is the seed from which uh, also our discussions are started. I remember I showed this picture only once. It was in Lisbon. It was one of the last talk I gave before the pandemic, uh, invited by Jose. Uh, Jose, nice to meet you. <laughs> and uh, in this picture at the center, there are two persons, one with a red dress and the other blue dressed. And uh, these are the two people. This one is Aristotle and this one is Plato. And uh, probably you remember the discussion uh, which animated the philosophy for hundreds of years. And still today, we, the problem is that we are st still discussing this uh, dualism. The vision uh, uh, that the world uh, is just a representation of something that we don't know. Maybe you remember the paradox of the cavern that was uh, in the, invented and presented by Plato, and the, the more Aristotelic idea that uh, things are real. We are discussing a, 
about this also today because we have signs from the brain that probably both were right. And uh, I consider this particularly interesting. A lot of philosophers tried to address this point, this issue. Uh, one very famous was Descartes. Descartes gave the illusion to solve the problem by creating these two concepts, the res extensa, the reality, and the res cogitans, the idea. But the problem for Descartes was that at the end, the res, the substance in Latin, is just one. And uh, he was a little bit uh, in uh, troubles in finding the solution to this uh, dilemma. And the solution he found is that the substance is God. So he abandoned the empirical approach and uh, we cannot go ahead in this direction. Why I start from this? I start from this because the human beings are fascinated by dualisms, uh, mind, brain, brain, body, bad, good, uh, even hell, uh, yin and yang. And at the end, I put the dorsal and ventral. Dorsal ventral is one of the strongest dualism populating neuroscience and uh, invented by uh, Leslie Ungerleider a lot of years ago, uh, who had the merit to understand that in the brain, the processing of information is not sequential as uh, usually happens in a computer program, but uh, works uh, usually in parallel. This is just uh, a, rep a, representation of, uh, a representation of the two main streams uh, used by the brain according to this tra traditional idea to discriminate objects on the ventral stream <coughs> and uh, to act on objects, the dorsal stream. Traditionally, the inferotemporal cortex has been considered the region of the brain which works in parallel with the dorsal stream to uh, create a semantics of the object. And this was shown by human patients, for example, having lesions in the temporal cortex and uh, becoming unable to name, uh, for example, uh, this pencil, but they were still able to use the pencil. And vice versa, lesions in the dorsal stream create the opposite phenomenon. I am able to name the pencil, I recognize the pencil, but I cannot use it. Um, the temporal lobe, uh, I could stay hours on this because it's fascinating, the, the story of the semantic categorization of objects. I consider the approach by Tommaso Poggio one of the most bright we, we, we have. Uh, obviously, there are big problems here. For example, we have to consider the invariance with respect to the orientation. So you recognize the pencil from this perspective, this one, and this one. It, this is not an easy task. Uh, there is an invariance uh, uh, as far as dimension is concerned. You recognize the pencil here and you recognize the pencil here. And for the brain, these are difficult tasks. But the main point is that, uh, and the main discussion is, uh, is this a bottom-up bottom process from the occipital uh, towards the frontal part of the brain or is it a top-down process? Or I, I would prefer to uh, select uh, an intermediate uh, uh, answer and probably both sides work at the same time. The top-down is fundamental for categorization, but at the same time, the bottom-up is fundamental for description. So what about the dorsal stream as far as the, the categorization of things is concerned? Dorsal stream, I cannot go, uh, go into details now, but anyway, is formed by a mosaic of areas uh, parieto frontal. I don't know if you can see the, the mouse while I'm moving on the screen. Uh, yes. Can you see the arrow yes. of the mouse? Yes. Oh, great. Yes, yes. I felt paralyzed because of this. Anyway, you have a, a parietal mosaic of areas which, are by the, which is bidirectionally connected with a similar frontal mosaic of areas with some preferential connections. And uh, in order to better understand what I mean when I say that the dorsal stream is important for semantics as well, I show you, for example, a collection of chairs. Visually, these chairs are completely different. If you look at this chair here, this is a wooden hand which serves as chair, but uh, in terms of visual recognition, this would pose a lot of problems to some automatic recognizing systems. But for the dorsal stream, 
All these chairs are chairs because they share some fundamental properties, which are, uh, I would say, generalizing at least two. The first property is the fact that the chair must be stable on the ground, and indeed there are legs. And the other important thing is that uh, there should be something where we can put our back and our bottom. And uh, if you use this kind of uh, categorization, which is a sort of embodiment of the chair with the chair. So we use our body representation, our physical body, in order to understand physical things. And thanks, thanks to a continuous interaction with objects, we create this uh, mutual or mutually informing uh, flow of information between the brain and the things. Uh, I always show to my students this example, just for fun. The, there are competitions, uh, and Yanis knows this very well, among computer scientists. You can say, for example, this is the year of the umbrella. Okay, and then in order to win the prize, uh, you have to recognize, for example, by using Google, Google Pictures, <coughs> as much umbrella as possible in, on the internet. Very nice task. I understand that from a computer scientist's point of view, this is a very difficult task to solve because this is an umbrella open, this is a closed umbrella, different orientation, this is not completely closed, but uh, anyway, today people are very good in doing this. And maybe by using also artificial intelligence, a lot of things can be, can be done. But uh, from the perspective of the brain, this problem is a false problem because for us, uh, this one is an umbrella exactly like this, for us, when I say for us, I say for the brain, but anyway, I don't, I don't want to be a brain. And uh, pictorially, this is very different from this. This would pose a lot of problems in terms of uh, visual recognition. These are also umbrellas. And why I call these umbrellas? Because what uh, unifies these apparently so different uh, uh, situations and objects is the goal. So in other terms, uh, all these things are useful to protect ourselves from the rain. How and how is possible to create this uh, bi-directional representation between the semantics and the, and the action domain? So how can we inform about the goal, the temporal cortex? We know that there are connections between the, the parietal and the temporal uh, brain region. Uh, I, would, I would like just to give you very fast uh, a couple of examples. Uh, this is one circuit linking, for example, uh, the frontal area F5, where, where is represented the grasping, hand grasping maybe, also the mouth in the more lateral part, and this uh, parietal region, which is called the AIP, anterior intraparietal. Uh, we know that if we record single neurons from F5, we will find neurons which respond during uh, grasping actions and uh, uh, responding specifically for particular types of grasping. And uh, more importantly, they respond in terms of goal of the action. In other terms, if I use the index finger to retrieve something from this plate here, okay, this will be coded from a neuron which is different from the neuron which uses again or activates again the index finger to scratch the face. We have seen this in the monkey brain many times, and there's a clear distinction between the premotor cortex area five and the primary motor cortex that we call the RF1, which lays in front of the central sulcus. Uh, I show you just one uh, picture from a paper that was published uh, uh, in Parma by my friends uh, in Parma. And in this case, this is a really a brilliant uh, idea. They, they use this tool here. This is a, uh, these are pliers for uh, escargot. In French restaurants, there are plenty of these tools. And uh, the idea was to use the pliers uh, in two ways. Obviously, they teach the monkey to use these pliers to retrieve some food. If you open the pliers, when you close your hand, you use pliers as normal traditional pliers, you close also the space between the actuating part of the object. While if you use traditionally the escargot pliers, in order to close, you have to release your hand. So they create a dissociation between the goal, which is the closure of the acting part of the tool and the movement that uh, produces this goal. And uh, what they found is that while in the primary motor cortex, 
almost every neuron codes the actual movement, so closures of the hand, not of the tool, versus opening of the hand, not of the tool, in the premotor cortex, the majority of neurons codes the behavior of the tool and not of the hand. We know that there are visuomotor neurons, and this is related to the things part of my title, which link, for example, the observation of an object to the actual physical action to interact with the object itself with a huge specificity. So neurons responding, for example, like in this case, this is one single neuron recorded from uh, RF5. And uh, this first peak is the visual response when the monkey observes this ring. And the second peak is the motor response when the monkey grasps. The same is true in the parietal cortex. This has been shown by the group by Hideo Sakata in Japan many years ago. Almost a similar, uh, a very similar picture with some difference anyway, which have become clearer more recently. For example, the group of Scherberger has studied by recording from the, at the same time from the intraparietal sulcus, primary motor cortex, and ventral premotor cortex bilaterally from monkeys with the electrode arrays. So many electrodes at the same time, a huge amount of neurons recorded at the same time. Not only he has shown that uh, the temporal profile of the discharge is different in the three cortical regions, which is pretty trivial. But what they found is that if they classify objects on the base of visual, sorry, and uh, visual and motor responses, the way by which objects are classified are grouped together, and this is a sort of syntax, and this is pretty related to poetic uh, idea. Uh, the way by which uh, the two brain regions classify objects is completely different. While uh, AIP, parietal cortex, classifies mainly by using geometrical rules, so the composition of uh, geometrical primitives, RF5 classifies objects based mainly on the physical interaction with the object. Is between is the conversation between the two uh, the two parts of the brain which creates a representation which is no more uh, neither purely visual nor purely motor. The mutual contribution of these two knowledges creates in our brain what we consider is an object, particularly in the case of tools. The same is true, for example, interaction with other people. You know maybe the story of mirror neurons. I don't want to go I have to go fast here. Neurons which uh, theoretically are not so different from uh, those visual motor neurons uh, uh, I show you here. So in other terms, uh, in place of having a visual discharge provoked in a motor neuron by the observation of an object, we have a, a, a visual discharge which is evoked by the observation of another individual performing an action similar to that encoded by the motor neuron. In other terms, the motor neuron is a is a as a two, two folded function. On one side to act, on the other side, the same motor representation that we use to act is used to recognize. Uh, this type of behavior, this architecture is a, is a sort of general law in the brain. We have this very similar situation in terms of sensory motor coupling in the circuit that is used by the brain to organize saccadic eye movements. In this case, uh, the visual stimulus that is, uh, let's say, the switching on of a light in the visual field, uh, which provokes saccadic eye movement towards that uh, stimulus, uh, evokes a response in the motor neurons which uh, move, move the eyes. So again, you see sensory and motor. Or uh, in another circuit, which is pretty famous, uh, between uh, linking together RIF4, in this case, uh, and VIP which is related to arm movement and proximal body movements, where we know the motor behavior, the motor discharge is related to the movement of these body parts, for example, rotation of the head. But at the same time, these neurons have also visual response. The same motor neuron has also a visual response, which is obviously not related to the observation of an object or not related to the observation of another person doing something, but is related, for example, to the presence of three-dimensional objects around our body is what we call the peripersonal visual space. This peripersonal visual space is measured in motor coordinates. In other terms, this point in space, the tip of the pencil, 
it is true that is a, I don't know, 30 centimeters in front of me, uh, 10 centimeters up with respect to don't know how to, the reference point has been always a big problem in the brain, but is encoded in terms of the action that they can do in order to reach this point. And this is the reason why we have these neurons in the ventral premotor cortex, which uh, when stimulated uh, provoke this kind of uh, uh, proximal movement, but at the same time, they present uh, tactile receptive fields. Imagine a neuron which rotates the head towards the right, tactile receptive field, but also a visual receptive field around the tactile, which anticipates in time the touch of the skin. So I'm finishing. Sorry if I took a little bit more, but uh, I'm sorry, but uh, this is the traditional view that everybody has, uh, not in neuroscience community, about uh, how the brain works. There is an external world, the, Arist the Aristotelic world, and there is a representational world here. Stimuli are generated by the world, pass through this chain of uh, processing, and uh, if the brain decides to move, there is a response going back to the world. This is pretty sequential and rigid schem schematic of uh, organization. This is what we know today. The motor representations here are not used only to move, to behave, but are also used to categorize things. They are sent back. In other terms, the parallel processing or originally proposed by Unger, Leider, and Miskin, it is true, it works, but at the same time, it's true that there is a, a bidirectional uh, communication with the frontal part of the brain, which continuously filters and informs the perceptual brain about the possibility of interaction with objects, with things, and with beings. Sensory motor neurons, therefore, challenge the traditional view on the motor system. We need the necessarily new categories to classify, to consider, to identify, to name them. They are neither motor nor sensory, are both. And the brain is right. If they, if they are both, it means they, they, they are useful. And uh, probably some old uh, concept like that of motor idea is something which could help us. And this means that the brain, in order to categorize things, doesn't use a, a sort of super brain, intelligent, which knows everything, but uses the same representations that we use to act. Obviously, we don't move when we see an object. We don't move while we observe another individual, but it's also true that in some cases, when we have, you have a lesion of the prefrontal cortex, which tonically inhibits the acting brain, if you remove this inhibition, patients automatically replicate the action of, other, the action of others, automatically use objects positioned in front of them. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Luciano. Now, Alessandro, you are left with uh, almost no time, <laughs> but now you, you do have five, five, ten, five, ten minutes, yeah? Okay, don't worry, uh, I'll be quick if I can manage to, yeah. I'm very sorry, but I know I'm no more able to give talks. This is the <laughs> I have to retrain myself. <laughs> do you see? Uh, the slides. Uh, you're in presenters mode, as I was when I started. Okay. So you have uh, to deactivate this option. Yeah. How about now? No, same thing. Same thing. No, it's the same, same thing. thing. Yes. Yeah. Now. It's yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Same title. Just continue with what Luciano was saying. I try to be quick. Okay, you all know everything about the neurons by this time already. So one inter interesting thing is that uh, uh, apart from this neurophysiological evidence, neuropsychological evidence, behavioral evidence, neuroimaging evidence, tons of evidence, there's something interesting. So the fact that basically that area that, that Luciano was pointing to, so the F5 area in the monkey, actually has a particular uh, cytokinetonic fingerprint that we can trace back to, to humans. And so we can make a link, a functional link between that area and what is uh, area BA44, which is Broca's area, which is famous for, for language. And uh, actually, you know, 
in the poeticons, uh, the similarity and relationship between action and language was at the core of the project. Let's jump a little bit in the future. Actually, uh, last week, <laughs> this is a, a very last second update. Uh, uh, we published a paper in Kind Biology on rats showing mirror neurons. This changes a little bit the picture because probably it says, okay, apart from the fact that this system is a highly conserved, uh, I mean, phylogenetically speaking, it means that we have a lot, of, a lot more options to study this mechanism because rats are easier to handle. And also they have shorter lives. So basically you can study the evolution of learning, the development and stuff, which is another interesting thing for uh, the people in Poetica. But let's go back in time. So our role in, in, uh, in Poeticon was to uh, explore several areas of research, action and speech uh, with a series of, 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 of areas. I'll just give you a glance of the many things uh, that uh, with you guys we did in all these years uh, in, during the process. So the neuroscience of affordances. We heard from Luciano about these canonical neurons. We had a paper, interesting one, showing selectivity. Uh, so a subthreshold motor response where passively observing objects providing different affordances. So specificity both in the cortical-spinal excitability, but also in the movement evoked by a parts of TMS. Uh, then the neuroscience of syntax, action syntax, Luciano briefly mentioned it. And as you can see, there's already a tight link between the terminology we use in language and here for, for action. Here you will probably recognize and probably see uh, later on this picture uh, a very interesting work uh, from, uh, from uh, like stemming out of the project, which is basically trying to merge uh, the terminology and also the organization and, and so on and so forth, taken from language together with the action domain. So trying to find and build uh, uh, an hierarchical structure also in the action domain. With this, we made several studies. We tried to produce violations in the semantic and syntactic uh, sides. As you can imagine, this is a semantic violation. You don't want, don't want to have Coke in, in and definitely not a Diet Coke in your coffee. Uh, otherwise, this is, a, sorry, this is a semantic violation, terrible one. Uh, otherwise, you can have a, a sy syntactic violation. So you invert the, 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 the sequence of events, like you first see the coffee and then you put water. Well, that's not possible. At least for us, Italia, it explodes, our brain explodes uh, into the sky. And uh, we made also other studies using the not concept. It's a long story, but as a side effect of poetic, we published several papers with this idea, uh, with neurophysiological techniques, uh, with this idea of uh, finding syntax uh, in the brain, also for action. So the neuroscience of speech perception is also a long story. <laughs> uh, it all started with, uh, actually it started before this, <laughs> actually with Luciano making uh, uh, cortical bulb excitability uh, measurements while people were listening to speech. Here it was a classification task. So basically we, we poke with the activity of the, of the motor system. So we disturbed the motor system in order to see whether that had an impact on speech perception. We found interesting results and again, side effect of poetic. Uh, along those years, we published several papers along these lines and entering into the details of, uh, of the hows and also the whys uh, of uh, the motor system with respect to uh, speech perception. So, but what happened after, uh, after the poeticons? Several things. Uh, obviously, we are, we, are, we are still investigating this, so we are not bored <laughs> by, by these themes. Actually, we love them. So uh, the things we've been investigating are many, and uh, I can try to summarize what are, what are the, 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 main, the, major, the, major, the major points. So, so we start from the fact that uh, uh, we know that human actions are characterized by environments. Actually, we, we grasp those uh, environments in order to help us make sense of the external world. So we use them as a kind of uh, classifier or filter in order to help us uh, uh, make distinction. And also we have predictive processing. So basically we have models of behavior and objects and stuff. So we use that in an, an anticipatory manner in order to simplify uh, the prediction about the future uh, information coming. So basically if you can read and at the same time you can write messages uh, that means that we have uh, a system that basically is exchanging information in order to co-regulate behavior with uh, partners. So 
I call it the evolution of mirror-based motor theories because it is based on more recent data. And uh, basically what we are focusing on recently, um, I have slides of studies, but I think I'm gonna cut soon because otherwise, you know, you always start with the idea of speaking like 10 minutes, but you know that it's gonna be 40. So this time I'll, I'll, I'll do my homework. Basically the, the interesting themes we're, we're exploiting now is, uh, is the fact that it's not just about invariance, but the fact that uh, within those environments, we also have individual motor signatures. This is uh, extremely interesting because you see variation also due to the high degrees of freedom that characterize human motion. So, and then another theme is the one of going down deep into the details, the mechanistic details of how action and perception are actually coupled. And so we are exploring the idea of uh, oscillatory coupling in brain dynamics. And then another one, is uh, very interesting because uh, usually with not just executing action and observing action, we typically do them at the same time. So we have to tease them apart in order not to mess everything up. As Luciano was saying, if you have frontal lobe damage, basically you use whatever object you see in front of you. You imitate automatically without being able to, to restrain yourself. So actually you, you, you want to merge the, the execution and the perception side in a, in a proper way. And we think that actually, actions during interaction are sculpted by inhibition. So imagine that the motor command is adjusted to your partner activity using also another control signal, which is via uh, inhibition. And then the one, the theme about interaction. So when we have a coupling of an inter-individual between people, action perception loops, uh, as we said, we have a sort of conversation, sensory model conversation. One thing that we are exploring both in the domain of action and in the domain of speech, obviously, is, uh, is to see whether we can find signs, measurements, uh, quantitative measures of, this, uh, of how this sensory motor conversation, communication actually causes adaptation to each other. So basically, if you can see those two brains, those two you know, action perception systems coupling to each other in a way that no longer belongs to subject A and subject B, but actually is a new equilibrium between these two uh, systems. So here I had a lot of slides with data, I jump, jump, I jump, I jump, sorry. <laughs> actually, I was very optimistic about the time I had. So summing up, so we're investigating uh, whether there's, uh, we can find a type and mechanism uh, window upon action perception loop. So we want to find markers of uh, the fact that people couple uh, these action perception loops between, uh, between them. Then the idea is that looking at individual motor signatures, we want to move a little bit uh, towards uh, uh, individual uh, neurophysiological differences. You know, neuroscience is based on big averages, finding the shared uh, uh, number between people. But basically we're losing all the idiosyncratic peculiarities of every one of us. So basically it doesn't touch the clinical side. It doesn't touch the possibility of change and characterize individual, uh, individual performance. And then moving from micro to, 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 to macro, I haven't shown you the data, but we're looking both at the microscopic scale of inter-individual coordination, but also uh, the macroscopic scale in order to establish uh, a way of looking how two brains interact with each other uh, at a multi-scale. And as I said, another important theme with applied consequences is to try to find, uh, based on all this uh, theoretical framework, try to find automatic ways of tracking behavioral co-regulation online. And so after that, you, the people, the poetic learners uh, may remember the people that were involved in many of these projects that I mentioned. Uh, uh, these are the people that made a lot of most of the work and are not working with us anymore. They moved to other lands. And, uh, and here instead are the people that uh, are now uh, in, a, in our center doing these kind of activities. You see the grants, obviously a big thank to everyone. And uh, hopefully you're invited all of you here in Ferrara as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Very nice.
Thanks. Ferrara and Ferrari, um, we hosted the first Peticon meeting for Peticon 1. So, yeah, and then we visited many times, of course, again. Thanks. So, let's proceed. If there are any questions, um, maybe we can accept questions as soon as the talk finishes, just a couple, one or two. Uh, if there are no questions yet, we can proceed and then, you know, we'll have some discussion time in the end, hopefully. Okay. You can also, for, for the audience, you can also post your questions in the chat and then in the end, in the discussion, we can go over sure. them. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, Anna. thanks. So, um, let's proceed with uh, Yanni Salimonos. Yanni, okay. the floor is yours. Uh... Okay, uh, that was a fascinating talk, uh, Luciano and Alessandro. This is amazing. And uh, we want to work with you for the motor theory. The so, same, the same for us. So, uh, <clears throat> as you know, cognitive architectures, they involve memory. Whatever paper you read, or book about cognitive architecture, there is memory in there. But which memory? Declarative, semantic, episodic, procedural, emotional, prospective, flash bulb. Now, I am fascinated by uh, what Hobbes wrote, that imagination and memory are but one thing which for diverse considerations have diverse names. Now psychology uh, is sort of going towards this direction and they are talking about mental time travel. There have been experiments where they are imagining the brains of people as they try to remember something and as they plan something for the future. And it looks like the same areas are active, as if the brain doesn't know the difference. So what I have been trying to do is to understand some complexity hierarchy of the action grammars. In Poeticon, as you know, we try to develop compositional systems for action. And we develop action grammars. Now, the question is, are there systems, because you know, you have, you have the chimpanzee and the bonobo, you have Homo erectus, the Neanderthal, Homo sapiens, you have this, you know, starting from 5 million years ago to like 100,000 years ago, you have all these different uh, ancestors of ours. And it is very important to understand uh, how they are different uh, in terms of the computations that they were able to do. So when it comes to action, to understand an activity that you observe, uh, are there some systems that are better than others? And what is involved? The reason for this is that we want to use action so that we can probe into memories. So when you look at an action, you can understand it in uh, at least these three levels that I have put here. I understand an action if I saw it before, like it's a baseball game or a wedding or whatever. These are things that you know companies are doing today because they want to categorize videos in Facebook and uh, in other social sites. And it's something that can be done using just kinds of operations. Now, a more interesting uh, problem is, I understand an action if I can predict what will happen next. Uh, now, it looks like animals are doing this. They are... Uh, able to perform this. And then finally, I understand an action if I can answer questions about it, like who, what, where, why. So 
it appears that only humans can do the third one. So there has been a controversy in the field. Uh, for example, in this, uh, in the journal Brain and Cognition, uh, a paper published by Zaccarella, Papito, and Frederici from the Max Planck Institute uh, on language and action in Broca's area of computational differentiation and cortical segregation. Uh, these guys are attacking the work that we did with Katerina, and they are arguing that no, no, language is special. Language needs grammars, but actions don't need grammars really. That's what they are saying. And on the other hand, people who study, you know, uh, the Paleolithic period, like uh, Cédric Gosserel in France, uh, he used uh, the grammar that we developed to show how the nappers, the guys that they were using uh, stones to carve other stones and make tools in the Paleolithic period and demonstrated, you know, uh, uh, how this could be accomplished with this grammatical uh, formalism. So there is a little bit of confusion because there exists really two basic structures in an action. One is a correlational structure. This is the Pavlovian association. You see something and then you expect something else. Then you see that something else, then you expect something else. You see that something else, you expect something else. This is how most animals learn uh, sequences. And then there is the instrumental uh, structure, which requires a grammar. There is also the notion of the goal in an action, because actions, there's a difference when actions are directed at a goal or the actions are driven by a goal. Because an animal that is performing an action, it wants to do something. It wants to get to the goal. So it is going towards that goal. But to have an action that is driven by a goal means that you start from the goal and you think you do problem solving. You say, what should I do in order to achieve this? So these two things are fundamentally different. Okay, this is an example of instrumental structure from other people's work, okay? So like you have some money, you wanna put it in a box, uh, then you have pick up a key, you unlock the door, you open the door, you can have, can have this different structures that describe this. This is the instrumental structure. You cannot get away from the grammar if you are to implement the, uh, uh, that instrumental structure. So now, <clears throat> this is from another example where uh, uh, somebody is making tea and uh, here they use what they call schemas. Uh, it's very similar to a grammar, but then what they are doing is they have a neural network that they are learning. They are learning to predict the sequence. Today, you can do this with uh, LSTMs or transformers of some kind. Uh, and so what you see here on uh, the bottom right is the workings of this network here, because you have you have here several neurons that have, let's say, values zeros and, and ones. You have a very long vector, and then you have to go to that uh, multidimensional space and project down to two dimensions in order to show what is going on. And this is this this paths that you see here is just moving uh, uh, along the values inside that network that is about that has learned the action. And in other words, it is as if you are moving in a finite state automaton, as if these are states and you go to those states and then you move to another state and then you move to another state and so on and so forth. But these states are learned somehow by continuous observation. So, 
if you think about the Pavlovian reflex, where you see something and you learn to expect something else that comes afterwards, and then you see that something else and so on. These are what you can call regular grammars uh, that have productions like this. And basically it is as if you have a tape and in this tape you have these uh, cells and in cell you see your symbols. And when you see a symbol, you move from one state of the finite automaton to another state. And you see another symbol, you move to another state and so on and so forth. And that describes the understanding of the action. Now, I need to tell you what goes inside these cells, okay? But before that, so at some point, people started doing things with two hands, all right? So when you have a regular grammar, the essence of the regular grammar is that you have this activity where at every point in time, you have to remember one thing, only one thing. And that thing is the state in which you are. But if you start doing things with two hands, like the nappers were doing that were uh, hitting stones to make tools, then you have to remember two things. You cannot do it by remembering one thing because you have two hands and every hand is not doing the same thing. Every hand is doing necessarily different things. So in order to uh, have an activity that you have a grammar that you represented and you have to remember two things, you need a context-free grammar. Otherwise it's not possible. Again, as before, you have your input, you see what is inside the cell, you move inside your finite state automaton, but you also have a stack. And every time you make a movement in the state, you do something in the stack, like you put something in or you take something out. So having the finite automaton and the stack, now you can remember two things that are absolutely necessary for this. So, What goes inside the, the cells? What goes inside the cells uh, is something that we uh, have agonized over over the years because it has to be some symbol. But that symbol is coming out from some continuous activity, like the hand is moving in order to touch something. So basically, you have movements. What goes inside those cells are specific kinds of movements. Right? You can call them motor concepts or motor ideas or whatever. And I got inspiration from Frank and Lillian Gilbreth that they lived long time ago. Actually, they are famous because, they, uh, because of them, they made a movie uh, called Cheaper by the Dozen in 1960s, where it described their lives. Uh, there was a remake of that movie in the 90s where Steve Martin is playing. Interesting movie. So this guy, Frank Gilbert, and his wife, who, as you see, lived close to 100, uh, they were, uh, they developed a system for analyzing the emotions that are involved in performing a task. What this guy wanted to do, he wanted to help the American worker and because the industrial revolution had started and there were many people working in the factories, he wanted to figure out, it was like sort of the beginning of ergonomics. He wanted to find out how to help them so that they don't help themselves and, and so on. So their motivation was to reduce unnecessary emotions. And they arrived at this general system by observing thousands and thousands of workers in factories for many, many years. And what they found is they found that there are 15, what they called primitives or verbligs. Verblig is the name Gilbreth backwards. So 
So these individual primitive things that they saw that all workers were doing, they called them their blitz. And they, they came up with 15 and then later people uh, extended them to 18. So examples of their blitz, TE, transport empty, the hand is moving with nothing in it. TL, transport load, the hand moving with something in it. G, grasp, H, hold, R, release, preposition, position. This is tricky because it's used. Here is a particular verb that you are doing. Assemble, disassemble, etc. So if someone is making a bowl of cereals and bread with milk, this activity, you can turn it into this bread clips. The plate, like you can now put arguments like nouns and locations. G plate, TL plate table, R plate, etc. This is the action. So now the ability to predict contacts by hands and tools and the relevant objects allows us to basically translate from vision language to their bleak language using transformer networks. Okay, so these are what I would call the their blicks of the monkey. Okay, these are experiments from Graziano, mortal cortex, where by uh, stimulating particular locations, you elicit a movement of the of, of the monkey, like he's moving the hand forward, or he's moving the hand to the mouth, or whatever. So the idea being that these their blicks are basically primitive things, motor concepts, you can call them that are involved in the programming of any activity. You have to put them together one after the other appropriately. So to demonstrate these ideas, we work with a data set called Epic Kitchens, where it is an egocentric uh, video, where right? people working in a kitchen doing things and the, the, the video is collected from sensors on them. Uh, and then we developed uh, uh, techniques in order to find the, this is the contact at the anticipation map, where what, that is as the person is moving his hands, which part of the scene is he about to come to contact with? And if you can do that, you can also do the next active object. Which object that is the seg segmented version of that object is going to be involved in the action. And so we have been using, as I told you, uh, transformer networks. And here is the, the activity. And uh, this transformer takes the video and turns into the verblings and then a reasoning network because the verblings, they have constraints. If you are uh, moving your hand with, and you are holding something, then you cannot grasp something else. So there are constraints between them. And by using them, you can basically turn the activity in the video into uh, you know, take up, take box, open box, pull serial, et cetera. And we participated, actually, I, I need to show you that uh, how good this is, okay? Because what we're doing is we're predicting. We're predicting the next thing, okay? But you have to show it in these big data sets, how good we are predicting. And so we use this concept, as I told you, of uh, contact. And we call this uh, egocentric object manipulation graphs. OK? Uh, you can see here from the activity, as you are building those graphs that are denoting objects that come into contact with the hands. And we were able using this uh, technology to win the action anticipation challenge in the Epic Kitchens data set. We did that in 2020, and we still hold the, uh, the first position. 
people have come close, but we are still uh, the best in this. So in other words, these ideas like work, they can predict the activity. So now a consequence of uh, their bleaks is that basically actions are nothing but small programs. So, so here is a motivating example. If you have somebody cutting things or picking them from here, putting them on the board, cutting them, putting them back. You can write this whole activity as a program where now these are functions. And so in other words, we can conceive of action representations as being small little programs that we can run, we can implement in order to achieve the action. And these programs have parameters because one could say grasp X, what is X? X could be a tomato, X could be whatever it is, would be instantiated in the compilation. Now the functions of, uh, so we are building a programming language called AL for action language. Uh, and this programming language have functions like that. Place, move, left, above, etc. And of course it has primitives. And let me say a couple of words because primitives have been thought of from the linguists, Boguslavski about 100 years ago in uh, Poland and his student Vesbika, who is now a professor in Australia, they understood that there are primitives from what? From Leibniz, because Leibniz, Leibniz made the following thought, which is a brilliant thought. He understood the recursive notion of understanding. That is, you understand something in terms of something else. And that's something else in terms of something else, and so on. But this must come to a stop. Otherwise, you won't understand anything. And so where do you stop? You stop where you understand something in terms of itself only and nothing else, like touch. You know if somebody touches you or if you touch something because you get directly input from the tactile sensors. So the linguists then, what they did is the following. They said, if there are primitives, then all these primitives in all the different languages, they have to mean exactly the same thing. So what they did is they looked at 28 different languages. And in these 28 different languages, they found about 70 concepts that they mean exactly the same thing. So they said, these are the primitives. But I think that uh, this is necessary, and but not sufficient. In other words, if the concepts are primitive, then they have to mean the same thing in all these languages. But if they mean the same thing, they are not necessarily primitive. So what they found, I believe, is a superset of the real primitive concepts. Okay, so examples of the language, and then we are building compilers like the visual action language compiler that will look at video and produce a program, which is the action. And augmented reality, where basically you go to do a task, we call this visual action language debugger. Uh, why? Because you can use now augmented reality. This is one of my favorite problems uh, as a manual, where you go to do something, and you are looking with your glasses and it tells you, plug the power cable to the power socket and shows you. And then instead you press this button and it will tell you, no, no, this is not the right action. Please follow the on-screen instructions. So these kinds of manuals, you can build automatically by observing this particular uh, 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 
uh, action. Okay. Now let me come to uh, the punch line. Yes. If you know an action sequence, then you know it in one way. Like think of the alphabet, you know the alphabet, A, B, C, D, et cetera. So if I ask you to go to say the alphabet backwards, you have a little problem. You cannot do it so easily. Okay, so now, if you know how to do an action, you have your verb leak, another one and another one and another, finally you have the goal. So you have the sequence. Now, if I give you G, the goal, and I ask you, oh, I want you to do this. Okay, how are you gonna do this? You have to remember that sequence so that you remember what comes before G. It's the WM. So you know that G is the result of your action. So you go in your mind, W1, W2, W3, WN, G. Oh, WM. Now you have to remember that you have also short term memory. You cannot remember like everything, only a few items. So you remember the WN. Oh, you say, I have to do WN. Now, what comes before WN? Now you have to go back from the beginning and start the alphabet again, going W1, W2, WN minus one, WN, oops, WN minus one. So what I'm trying to say is that in order to solve a problem, given some specification, you have to have the ability to go back and forth in the representation of the activity. And uh, the language, the language that consists of strings and they reverse strings is context-free. You have to have a context-free grammar in order to be able to do this. Otherwise it's not possible. Now, we have been studying actions. Now the question is, what is after that? What is after that is the events. Uh, if you look around you, you are always experiencing an event, always. Even if nothing's happening and you see an object, you don't just see an object, there's an object sitting on the table or there's an object on the floor, always. So, what we need is an event grammar because the actions that you have, see the, the problem with the events is that they are spanning a very, very big scale space because picking up an object is an event, a wedding is an event, a funeral is an event and so on. To give you an example from the great Goldman, here is his example, he moved his hand he started a fly that flew away. He touched the queen. He moved the queen to a new location. He checkmated his opponent. His opponent dies from a heart attack. This is the first game he ever won. Now, there are all these things happening, but some of them are co-happening. Some of them are causally happening and so on and so forth. So this event has some structure that is made from the sub events, but there is an organic relationship between the sub events. So perhaps there is a schema or a graph that uh, would come out of this. And when it comes to episodic memory, which is a very important component of our enterprise, you know, uh, the, the model of Badley uh, that for short-term memory that uh, postulates an episodic buffer, the spatial sketch part, phonological loop, etc. The episodic buffer is the important thing because when you want to go to episodic memory, first of all, let's say in episodic memory, you have you know an event where somebody uh, uh, you, you saw someone who was walking and, uh, he, and he, let's say, he threw up uh, before giving a talk. So you remember that, but you don't remember 
the details of the working because the procedural memory will tell you this. The procedural memory is a memory for all the actions that you have. So the procedural memory will tell you how he was working because the episodic memory, some, you are making it up. So, so my point is that in order to extract things from the episodic memory or to make them up, you will have, you have the episodic buffer with which you are going to communicate. And what do you put in the episodic buffer? What is inside the episodic memory? My view on this is that what it is, is bits and pieces of parse trees or of uh, uh, little programs or, uh, or, uh, or derivations or however you want to call it, some mechanism from which you can reconstruct what was going on. Now, in some sense, episodic memory and procedural memory are complementary because episodic memory will have the little details that procedural memory doesn't care about because procedural memory is on how you actually do the task. Uh, so, so in, in my opinion, I think there is a lot of territory to investigate in the memory uh, uh, land where <coughs> we can take the view that really memory amounts to reconstructing something, making it up from some information that is there. And in order for that to happen, you will, we will have to take advantage of the infrastructure of action or how or to use Luciano's terminology of the motor ideas and the motor concepts that you have. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you. Very interesting. And you give me a very nice uh, pass to talk about memory, but I will, I will focus on the role of language. And I will comment a bit on the primitives that uh, linguists um, uh, have thought of. Uh, it's not only the ones you mentioned, but other uh, people working in knowledge representation and someone have talked about primitives a lot. So I think it's a good pass. So let me share my screen. We're a bit, we are a bit um, um, late. I will try to catch up a bit on my own uh, presentation. Let's see. Okay. So I will talk about language memories and dangerous things, just to paraphrase uh, Lakoff and his work on uh, uh, metaphor. Um, my focus is language in cognitive architectures, the role. Uh, what is the role of language? Um, if we look at, uh, if we uh, take a very, you know, a perspective towards uh, what's going on in the state of the art up until now, and we will see that language seems to play um, three roles. First of all, we have a language models in cognitive architectures, um, which uh, involve uh, speech, text, understanding, and generation. So the role of language is the, the human-friendly communicator. Language is the means uh, that enables um, human-friendly verbal interaction in, in cognitive agents. There are many projects using um, uh, developing modules of this kind, and this is the role that they ascribe to language. In practical, we did work on that, uh, actually quite a lot of work, especially from the uh, new scientific perspective of um, uh, the role of the motor articulation in speech recognition, uh, in speech perception. However, uh, we also focused on um, other roles that language can have within a cognitive architecture. Um, a second role is um, language being the master chef of learning. And what do I mean by that? I mean that um, language has been used to represent knowledge. So what uh, Janis men mentioned earlier on, another, and Lucian, I think, uh, the development of uh, uh, long-term memory modules, semantic memories in cognitive uh, architectures, uh, usually relies on uh, representing uh, our knowledge about uh, objects and actions uh, using um, 
uh, concepts that are completely language centric. I will explain this a bit more in a, in a minute because this is where I will focus uh, this talk. And uh, the third role that language has taken in cognitive architectures is that of a lonely rider. I would call it like that because language is usually treated in isolation from um, perception and action. So usually language modules are being developed uh, without really uh, talking uh, to um, uh, perceptual modules or uh, the motor system of a, of a cognitive uh, agent. Uh, we just have some input-output interaction, but it does not share um, the same, let's say, language or the same uh, basic cognitive mechanisms um, with uh, perception and action. And also in practical, this is another aspect uh, that we worked on. And through the, uh, the minimalist grammar of action, we uh, managed to uh, create, to formulate a framework within which we can describe uh, any kind of meaning, either expressed verbally or uh, motorically or perceptually, uh, through uh, the same um, uh, grammar. But let's focus on, on memories and the, um, uh, and well, I, I just argued that um, knowledge presentation, the way we present knowledge in, in our uh, computational memories, uh, is language centric. First of all, a cross introduction mm -hmm. into long term memory, because I will focus on long term uh, memory. Uh, Janis uh, gave you a, a taste earlier on. Episodic memory is usually a memory of very specific learning experiences. Um, Robots uh, usually have episodic memories nowadays, uh, so they perform what we call one-shot learning. Uh, semantic memory is the generalized knowledge of the world, so these general patterns, um, and general, general, general knowledge about the object categories, uh, types of actions, uh, and so on. And the procedural memory, which is related to um, action sequences, how to learn an action, uh, what you learn uh, with regards to action sequences. Now, the main issues in when we study um, human memory or when we want to develop um, a, a computational memory uh, is what kind of knowledge is stored there, uh, what is the structure of the memory space. And how is the memory going to, going to be used? How will it be activated in search, in retrieval, in decision making, and so on? Um, looking at the neuros neuroscientific uh, work on memories, there are many theoretical accounts of the structure and the neural basis of semantic memories, for example. You can see here some references. Generally speaking, and now I simplify a lot. Um, most studies agree that concepts, or what we could call concept, uh, what Luciano mentioned earlier on, the, the representations which are neither motor nor sensory, and so on, are flexibly distributed representations. Okay, uh, and of course they, compri they comprise the modality uh, specific conceptual features. Uh, also, uh, there's a common agreement that the semantic memory content is related to perception and action, of course, and you hear this from uh, Luciano as well, but this is not straightforward um, in the knowledge representation field nowadays, okay? Uh, this is information that we get from uh, neuroscience. So how have scientists proceeded, I mean, since the very early days of uh, artificial intelligence, how have they tried to capture a knowledge of the world, knowledge of uh, objects, knowledge of actions, knowledge of events, knowledge of um, uh, even abstract uh, ideas? Uh, the two main uh, ways to categorize the knowledge of the world is through storytelling and uh, through some kind of um, uh, taxonomy, let's say. Uh, storytelling is being used when uh, developing, for example, knowledge bases uh, through which you try to uh, get out of people some common sense facts. Okay, there are quite a few knowledge bases today that have been created using this methodology. Uh, there are other uh, resources like uh, computational lexica and so on that uh, have a more taxonomic structure or they also incorporate uh, other ontological relations, like uh, metonymic relations, uh, and so on. Uh, generally speaking, the traditional representation format 
of semantic knowledge uh, in the computational field uh, has been through the so-called semantic networks. Most of you will be familiar with this. And uh, feature bundles. So you represent an object or an action with some features that may or may not um, uh, uh, form part of the, of the object or the action that is to be represented. And as I said, there are a number of knowledge bases out there that have been used um, many times, I mean, thousands of times by uh, computer scientists working in AI, regardless the methodology they use in AI. I will mention here briefly WorldNet, which is a, a very big lexical um, a database, uh, which includes taxonomic relations and so on. And other common sense knowledge bases like ConceptNet, Psych, there are quite a few. Um, semantic memory modules uh, have also been incorporated in a number of uh, well-known cognitive architectures like SOAR, ACTR, ICARUS, and others. So there is a big interest in their development because they do have this uh, pivotal role in, um, in the cognitive architecture. They are core for any learning process if we want to develop agents that can learn and do not start everything from scratch every time they have to do a task. And uh, they, they can allow reasoning and uh, uh, higher order uh, decision making. This is a, an example of concept net, one of these uh, knowledge bases that uh, have been created by uh, crowdsourcing information from um, everyday people regarding common sense, uh, everyday facts. Uh, if we take a very brief look in this uh, network, semantic network, uh, you will see that the nodes which uh, stand for concepts, semantic uh, information units, and the edges, uh, which stand for relations, semantic relations between uh, objects, um, are sometimes a bit strange. So, for example, uh, getting to bed early has been identified as a single concept. Uh, then wake up, waking up in the morning is another concept an action co concept, obviously, and so on. So uh, the question is, uh, what's the principle behind identifying these units of information as single concepts? What was the criterion for doing so? Um, actually, there was no principle behind it because there are computational processes that uh, create such networks. And um, there is no theory, very surprising, there is no theory to guide this kind of research. Uh, what is a concept? It's a very basic question, and uh, people have not um, uh, uh, have tried to address this. But um, uh, at least in computation, we haven't seen um, any any theory or any implementation of a theory uh, that has some uh, very specific principles uh, behind this. And here I will mention the exception of the work we did in Praticon for the Praxicon, but this will come uh, in a minute. So the question is, what is a concept? Uh, what is this representation of my knowledge of an object, of an action, and so on, uh, that is um, somehow activated in my brain uh, as I interact in the world, as I perceive, as I do things? If we look at the state of the art in uh, AI, uh, the first answer is um, a word is a concept. So as I said, in all these knowledge bases, um, the concepts are usually uh, words. Uh, one word equals one concept. We have one-to-one -one, uh, relation there. And in some other cases, we have a phrase, like the phrase I mentioned earlier on, waking up in the morning, that arbitrarily, with no principles for this decision, they have been chosen as corresponding to a, a specific, co to a single concept. And what is a semantic relation? Again, looking at the state of the art, a semantic relation can actually be anything. Anything that is verbally expressed uh, somewhere in a piece of text. Uh, so you have uh, relations which are, for example, ESA relations, taxonomic. You have meronymic relations, so these um, uh, quite common and well-known re semantic relations between um, categor categories of objects and actions. But if you look at these semantic networks, you can also see relations, for example, like acquisition of. So X was acqu acquired by something X. How and why is this the case? Because um, in many cases, at least what we do computationally is to process pieces of text in order to extract automatically um, 
words that we stand as concepts in our semantic network and relations that are verbally explicitly expressed in the text uh, to so that we uh, draw a match so that we associate a word with another uh, word, a concept with another concept. Actually, this is what is going on when we create uh, concept maps. Uh, you might have heard of concept maps or mind maps, uh, which are tools that uh, people use for brainstorming and you know, creating uh, graphs, concept graphs uh, of ideas they have or things that they learn. Uh, concept maps are used extensively at schools by children so that they try to reflect what they learn from a piece of text. Here in this slide, you will see a very small uh, piece of text from a geography textbook. And uh, on the side, you will see in the figure, you see a, a, a semantic network kind, uh, uh, a graph kind of uh, representation, semantic graph representation of the information that uh, a student uh, got from the piece of text. If you look at this carefully, uh, you will see that uh, the relations here are exactly phrases from within the sentence. Uh, this is not what goes on, of course, in um, knowledge representation uh, by scientists, but uh, this is the extreme case okay, of what is going on with uh, laymen uh, trying to uh, reflect their semantic knowledge about the field. Uh, but scientists are not very far from something like that, exactly because they do not have um, uh, principles or theories on uh, uh, how to single out a concept, uh, a, 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 an independent unit of information, of knowledge, and what kind of uh, relations to uh, identify, to capture uh, between uh, concepts. Now, I mentioned earlier on that uh, language is a lonely writer and knowledge bases are language centric. Uh, there are many attempts to add um, multisensual information in knowledge bases. And this goes back uh, quite a lot, actually, to the very, again, to the very first uh, days of AI. Um, so um, I will just mention a couple of examples here. Um, uh, ImageNet, that uh, Luciano showed us earlier on, uh, is um, uh, a, knowledge, a visual a knowledge base that has been uh, coupled with WordNet. So what the researchers did, uh, the um, computer vision guys, uh, who developed ImageNet was to uh, attach images of objects, not of actions yet, uh, as far as I know, and mainly of objects, to um, uh, concepts in the WebNet uh, knowledge base. So they coupled uh, words, lexical concepts, and the corresponding images. Uh, however, this does not solve the problem. This does not uh, make a, a knowledge base uh, less language-centric than it was before. Because again, the way we um, identify single concepts is by thinking in linguistic terms. And those of you who have some background in language, you will remember that what comprises a word is a very big debate in uh, language. Um, in the European languages, uh, maybe it's a bit easier to identify the to segment words in a stream of up uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, in other languages that have a different system, um, the, it is not that straightforward. So in Chinese, for example, it's not straightforward to uh, tell what comprises a word. Okay, so even from a linguistics perspective, using words uh, to represent to stand for single concepts for independent semantic units. Um, is not a good idea. So, okay, let's say that knowledge representation is language-centric. So what? Uh, the so what is that this, is, this can be dangerous in many cases. And I will give you um, a couple of examples. Um, first of all, of course, this is uh, not uh, what goes on in the, um, in the human memory system. But, okay, let's say that we are not that picky. And uh, we believe that if something works computationally, then okay, it can, it, it's okay if it's not like uh, what goes on in the human memory. Uh, the problem is that language-centric uh, knowledge bases can lead to wrong generalization, or they can hinder uh, reasoning by artificial agents. Uh, here we will see, um, uh, I won't play the, the video, just uh, we look at the image right now. Here we have ICAB, uh, which learns 
how to uh, put Syria in a box. This was part of a demo we had in, uh, in Predicon, in Predicon 1, actually. So here are colleagues, uh, I think that Dean is the one who holds Hakam's uh, <laughs> hand. Uh, they say, put the Syria in the box. Uh, the ICAP is being trained to identify, to recognize, sorry, to recognize um, the uh, box with the serial, okay, and uh, to perform the action. So we will hear later on the ICAP saying that I need to grasp the serial and so on. Now, uh, something that we realized early on in practical was that um, uh, when our colleagues who performed um, object recognition uh, sessions with ICAP uh, were labeling the objects to be um, to be shown to ICAB, and they were using what we do every day in everyday language use, um, metonymies. So they would talk about serial, but what the the ICAB perceived was a box. So this is quite common in language. We talk about the contents of something uh, rather than uh, the container which is perceptually uh, visible. Um, so, if we do an agent with uh, a knowledge representation um, uh, uh, memory uh, that um, does not account for the relation between language and the real world, what it refers to, uh, then there is a, a problem here of uh, generalization. Every time the ICAP will look at boxes, it will name them as serial. Okay, so going from episodic learning to semantic memory formation, uh, we run into the danger of uh, uh, making a wrong gen generalization, over generalization actually, that all boxes uh, are serial, or this is how they could, uh, could be named. You can imagine the, uh, what this can lead to, okay, the, the problems in reasoning and uh, uh, decision making that can, uh, can be caused by something like that. So our knowledge representation has to make sure that uh, whatever stands as a single concept, for example, of an object uh, in the uh, memory uh, is um, a corresponds to what is being referred to by language, what is perceived or what is acted on upon um, by the sensory motor system. Uh, similarly for actions like cutting, uh, we may decide that we will um, uh, teach uh, an agent how to cut but actually labeling an action that we demonstrate to the, to the robot with just the word cut um, is very problematic uh, because um, um, cutting as a word refers to, may refer to many different things. It actually refers to a goal, a goal that can be satisfied uh, with many different movements. It's different to, to cut a, with a knife a tomato, it's different to cut with your hands a paper, to tear it in two and so on. So uh, unless uh, we specify, which is something that is usually done uh, perceptually by uh, uh, focusing on the details of how a movement is being performed, of how, of how an, a goal is being achieved, uh, we cannot really um, uh, really learn uh, an action and really um, proceed to correct uh, generalization and reasoning. Um, I have another example here with uh, just to illustrate the point, but uh, since we are short of time, I won't really go into free, uh, into this, I will skip through it. Um, let's say that someone is requesting an agent to uh, put a fan in, in a case. Uh, what kind of prior knowledge is needed there? Uh, there are many different things that the agent needs to know, and here is simplify a lot. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if um, the way we encode information in the semantic memory uh, follows the common state-of-the-art approach of uh, listing some uh, um, facts like uh, the fan has this shape, uh, and it may also have another shape, okay? Um, putting something somewhere is uh, kind of moving some, something somewhere else. Um, this kind of representing information is not enough. I cannot tell the agent to really understand what it has to do and to uh, perform the action. Uh, for one thing, um, uh, we need information on the results of actions. Uh, we need, here you can see, uh, for us here we see an action concept to close something with your hand, to close the fan with your hand. For us, this is a, a single concept. As you realize, we do not use single words. 
uh, to stand for uh, movements, uh, but have a theory on what an action comprises, what are the um, basic constituents of an action, the tool, the effective object, and so on, the end goal to be achieved, and so on. We have defined this through the minimalist grammar of action, and we have implemented it in the development of the Capacitance Semantic Memory. Um, we have done a lot of work, unfortunately, there is no time to go through uh, our own uh, semantic memory model. But um, what I wanted to, to say here is that the way we encode, represent, if you like, information, knowledge, semantics in computational memories, uh, either short term or long term or whatever, they should share, I hypothesize, I suspect the same kind of encoding since they talk to each other. Um, it's very important. It is important uh, uh, for AI in general, and actually for any kind of any of AI methodology that we may use. Um, in symbolic AI, I think it's um, it's easy to understand uh, how knowledge presentation affects a uh, whole world-based system. Um, in such symbolic methods, in statistical methods, in deep learning, which are quite hot and very successful nowadays, uh, we still feed algorithms uh, with some kind of representation of data. We fit them with raw data in many cases, but still there is some representation of this data. In deep learning, and as far as text processing is concerned, uh, we usually feed algorithms with um, um, uh, textual representations of the level of a word or the character. When you're at the level of a character, semantics are kind of lost. Um, but again, as we said, the word is, that, is not a very good uh, level of representation uh, either. Um, a suggestion that we want to uh, explore in the years to come is that uh, uh, this conceptual unit, the level of representation we, we can use, is action-centric. And um, uh, maybe um, representing and coding information uh, for objects and actions, and even abstract concepts, uh, from an action-centric perspective, then we can really capture the semantics that are needed uh, for uh, encoding uh, knowledge and uh, effectively reasoning over uh, the prior knowledge we have and generalizing uh, using it. Um, as I said, the Praxicon, which is a semantic memory model we developed in the Praxicon projects, uh, has led us to looking into knowledge representation and language itself from a very uh, different in, than the state of the art and new perspective. Uh, a reference in language analysis has been found to be important if we are to connect again the lonely rider with the sensory motor um, experiences of, uh, of agents. And uh, reference can become actually the guiding principle in um, deciding what stands for uh, a concept that uh, refers to an object in the everyday uh, world or an action and so on. Um, okay, and I will finish here. Um, so the takeaway message that I wanted to give you was that we have been thinking, even we as linguists, but I think everybody, in, even in Yannis's talk, I realized that we have been thinking uh, in language terms. And it's very hard to do this reverse um, thing and uh, you know, start thinking about um, uh, what comprises uh, knowledge without uh, letting uh, language to uh, segment everything for us conceptually, uh, semantically. Um, there's a long way to go, but um, I think it's good food for thought for everyone along these lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katina. Remember that you can uh, use chat to write down your questions as we proceed to the next talk. So Lorenzo is up next. Yeah, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can you just confirm you can see my screen? Yeah, and I guess you can hear me well. Yes. 
All right, so thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to hear again this conversation after a few years and to see you all. Uh, right, so I'm Lorenzo Iamone. I'm a senior lecturer in robotics at Queen Mary University of London. And I will give you a bit of my perspective on cognition and this topic we are discussing. So uh, before Queen Mary, I was actually working with, uh, with Giulio and others at IAT. And then for a while, I've been uh, a postdoc at uh, Vish Lab, uh, working with Alex and Joseph. And actually, some of the things or most of the things I'm going to talk about today are those that I've been working on while I was in Lisbon during the Poetic Plus Plus project. And uh, at the moment I am in uh, London. And for those of you who don't know Queen Mary, uh, we are uh, uh, one of the top universities in the, in the UK, especially for, for our research. And uh, we are located in East London, in uh, uh, the sunniest part of London, as you can see from the pictures. And we are very proud to be a, a very inclusive university, uh, also because of the area of London in which we are located, but also because of our uh, really what we want to be. And so it's, it's very good to have a, a number of students from all different countries uh, with a lot of uh, variety. It creates a very good environment, I think. And uh, at Queen Mary, I am part of uh, ARC, which is the Advanced Robotics at Queen Mary. It's um, a recently established a robotic center. Uh, we are about five years old. And we do several things within robotics. We create robots and we do also um, software for controlling them in several applications. And in fact, we use like uh, by inspiration in different aspects of our work, uh, uh, also both for the bodies of the robot, as you can see example of some of the soft robots like this octopus and uh, for the brain of the robots, so their intelligence. And uh, within this group, uh, I lead uh, a, a subgroup that is called CRISP, which is Cognitive Robotics and Intelligent Systems for the People. And really, we are trying to bring forward this idea, which surely I share with many of you, that we can create smart robots, uh, so better robots, by taking inspiration from, uh, from biology in general. And at the same time, during the process, we can also understand something more about uh, human intelligence. And uh, at Queen Mary, I, I actually also teach cognitive robotics. And uh, when I have to tell students what cognition is, I initially was referring to uh, the UCOG uh, web, web page, some of you might be familiar with. And interestingly, they were asking for definition of cognition and uh, they came up with uh, 42 different definitions. And uh, the reason there are 42 is because they asked 42 people, otherwise there would be probably thousands of definition. So it's very, it's very hard to define what cognition is. But uh, so everyone has probably his own kind of personal view. But uh, if you look, for example, at the Oxford Dictionary, uh, they define as a process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through different means. And even if we go back to Descartes, uh, and he was, cited, he was already cited in previous talks. So really, there was a lot of effort let's say a lot of highlighting of the thinking uh, that is part of cognition. But what I personally believe uh, is that cognition is a lot about acting, a lot about doing things. So, um, so I say cognition is what allows people to do the amazing things they do every day, almost effortlessly. And when I think about the amazing things we do, uh, of course, you may think about something like this, which some people can do after a lot of training probably. And it's amazing that what we can achieve as, as human beings. But actually when I think about the amazing things we do every day, it's more like this. And this is actually very difficult for robots to do. Uh, and. Uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, maybe one interesting aspect is that, you know, in between the difference of thinking about doing things and actually doing things, is that when you think about things, um, for example, example of jumping on a chair, if you think about it and it's, it's always the same 
thing, right? Are you, well, are you, are you prepared and jump, or land on a chair? When you actually do it, it's always gonna be different. It's always gonna be a different set of movement. The movements I do are probably completely different from the movement another person would do. And depending on the environment, uh, the way I do it is gonna be different. So you may also see this as that the thinking, um, you may employ more abstract or symbolic representation, while when you do things, you have a lot of uncertainty, you have to adapt to this and be flexible. And, uh, and I think keeping this, assuming that this uncertainty is gonna be there, it's very important when we design cognitive architecture that should enable a robot to be intelligent, which for me is a lot about robots being able to do this kind of things in any kind of environment. In fact, this is what we focus more closely in our, in our team, which is what I call the intelligence of our hands. So anything smart that as humans we do with our hands is uh, somehow under the umbrella of uh, the research of my team at Primary. But we, before going into that, I'd like to show this, uh, uh, I think, very good video that was shot at, uh, at IIT. Um, and this is, was the final demonstration of our uh, Poeticon++ project in which in fact, you see the iCub uh, doing something like the tea making I was showing before. So it's in a relatively unstructured environment where we have several objects, we don't know where they are, we don't know what can we do with them. And starting from a, a verbal request, then the robot is able to, to carry out some tasks. And of course it involves all parts of reason, right? both the thinking about it and the, uh, realizing the, the, the actions. And as Katrina mentioned, uh, the support for this was the uh, cognitive architecture that we work on, and that included the, um, um, all of the partners in the discussion and the realization of this. And as you can see, there are different components. Uh, so a verbal request coming in, analyzed by a praxicon a symbolic reasoner, and then uh, some visual perception with a different type of object understanding and, uh, and then planning and action execution. And uh, in the Poeticon project, I was in Lisbon and we were focusing mainly on this part. And I will just give a couple of details about this, especially because it also resonates with things that have been presented before and discussed. And especially about uh, uh, how to incorporate uh, embodied knowledge of the agent into this reasoning pro process that will lead eventually to action being executed successfully. And so it's about perceiving the affordances of objects from vision and then using these affordances for action planning. And why I say this is uh, the kind of embodied reasoning is because in order to perceive the affordances, so per perception of affordances is a visual process. We, we see the object and we perceive what are the possible affordances or what are the possible actions that we can do and what are the goals of those actions. And in order to perceive these affordances, what happens in human is that we have a learning process in which we, we try things out, we find out the relationship between what we can do and the visual perception associated. And, uh, and then we use this knowledge. And this is exactly what we had uh, implemented in the iCub. And here you see some examples in which after a learning process, then the robot is able to, um, to choose the best uh, tool, for example, in order to pull an object closer. And, uh, and interestingly, uh, we train with the number of objects and then we show that we could have generalization. So the robot is in front of objects we were never seen before and still is able to use this uh, embodied visual perception to find out affordances that are useful for, uh, for itself, right? For this specific problem. So it's it's uh, egocentric embodied way of seeing the environment and using the environment. And um, so technically we, um, we, use, we model this with Bayesian uh, networks and the interest of using Bayesian models is that they are good for representing the the uncertainty. And, uh, and also with this kind of model, you can see that basically we put together information about the possible action, 
the effects of the action and visual uh, visual features of uh, uh, objects and tools. So objects that are in the environment, objects that we hold in the hand. And so we come up with a representation that is, uh, is visual motor actually. So it's not just a visual representation, it includes the motor components in terms of what is the action and what are the effects of this action. And so then we can use this in a number of ways to make predictions what are the expected effect of an action if I use this object and this other object, or what is the best object I should choose to achieve a certain effect, or even simply object properties, like what is the action that is elicited by this object that I'm seeing there. And, uh, and we use that representation, but different representation can be used. So uh, then of course, technicalities are important uh, especially because then we want to find a representation uh, that allows us to use this uh, encoded knowledge in the context of a wider architecture. Because otherwise there's a few things that we can do only with this. It's, this is interesting where we connect it with the other parts of the architecture. And, and so we used uh, Bayesian networks, but other architecture, other representations are possible. And I'm not sure whether Jose later will talk about representations because I saw the representation keyword in his, um, in his title. So if that was the case, this was uh, like a connection to that. But, um, but yeah, so when we represent affordances this way, this Bayesian framework, then when we perceive affordances, we, we have a nice way of integrating this with the action selection. And this is again, incorporating this physical intelligence in the reason. So we have this kind of symbolic reasoning about what action should we do that are coming from semantic reasoning uh, of the praxicon. And then the way in which we use this affordance knowledge is to ground this uh, list of possible actions into the actual environment in which the robot has to execute the action. And so, um, for example, let's just give an example here. If we have one of this action that is suggested by the proxy, by the semantic reasoner, which is uh, pull an object with a tool, because that in general will uh, make the object come closer to you, uh, then of course, Again, what is the difference if you think about it? Well, that's always going to be uh, it's a deterministic kind of knowledge. But then if you have to execute it, it's always going to be a slightly different action, maybe using a different object to doing it in a different way. So when we take this uh, generic action and do, then we use the affordances, we can ground this. We can say, oh, if we pull this specific object here, this green, uh, this red object, with this specific a factor of the tool, then we have a certain probability of the object actually coming closer or, or not. And this comes from what the robot has learned before in different situations. And in the Poeticon architecture, uh, it was interesting to have this represented in Bayesian networks because then we could use dynamic Bayesian networks for uh, probabilistic planning, in which we uh, sequence a number of actions knowing that the outcome of an action can have a certain probability of achieving this effect or a certain probability to achieve another effect or to achieving or to obtain no effect at all. And, uh, and yeah, so this is uh, um, the final uh, product in which, uh, in fact, you see many of the uh, reasoning processes happening. So you have uh, some aspects of the object recognition, which is the semantic, uh, recognition, right? So the object name are recognized so that they can be matched with a verbal request coming from the, from the user. And then there is also part of affordance recognition in which uh, we have to pull an object closer and we say, oh, can we use that tool? And what side of the tool should I grasp? What side of the tool should I use as an effector? And for this, we don't really know to need to know the, the name of the object. We don't necessarily know to connect this to the um, the semantic reasoning, we can do this with this uh, visual motor representations that are encoded in the affordances. Right, so, and that was 
the end of it, we were all very happy with this demonstration that we showed. Was it everything perfect? Uh, nothing more to work on? Well, the, the reality, of course, is that there were many occasions in which uh, things were going not exactly as expected. And uh, although, of course, entertaining, even for us in the lab, we uh, later on, I, I wanted to work more on this and try to uh, improve some other aspects of this, uh, of this problem. And uh, there are a few things which I think are, uh, they were part partially missing in our uh, poetic on work. And I, with, uh, with my team at the moment, I'm, I'm working on. Uh, one is uh, to use more uh, tactile representations. Uh, another one is to have some aspects of learning from humans. And all this uh, together in, um, in a, of course, the, the uh, cognitive architecture aspect is important. And of course, any cognitive architecture is also a software architecture that should support um, the, the movements and the actions of the robot. So I'll give you just a few, um, a few snapshots of the research we are doing now in the lab. So for example, for uh, the use of uh, tactile information, uh, we tend to um, combine tactile with, uh, with vision. So for example, you see here uh, some experiment in which we first detect the object by vision. Then in order to make sure that we are actually grasping, picking the object in the best way, we do some tactile exploration. And the tactile exploration here is basically moving the hand and touching the object in different points to understand what is the best way to pick it. And to understand what is the best way to pick it, we use something called unscented Bayesian exploration, optimization. And the, the core of this is that we explore and, when, and we try to find a configuration of the hand that is not just good in terms of the forces that we can measure, but is also safe in the sense that we assume there is this uncertainty. So we assume that when we replicate the grasp, it's always going to be a little bit different. So we try to find a configuration that is safe so that when we reproduce the action, even if the hand is slightly, for example, on the left or slightly on the right, it's still going to be a good grasp. So in the reasoning process here, we are actually incorporating this assumption that there is going to be uncertainty so that when we reproduce the action, it's always going to be a bit different. And then when we test this on several objects and in several um, uh, grasping and lifting action, we see that actually it provides an advantage. We minimize the chance of uh, losing the object after we pick it. In addition to that, now we are um, we are trying, we are thinking about, so we have already some initial results on including a symmetry assumption in this exploration of the object. And this is because, of course, uh, many of the objects that we deal with in real life, they, they are symmetric with respect to some plane of symmetry. So uh, our assumption is that if we, if during the search, we assume that there is a symmetry, and then we verify whether that symmetry exists during the exploration. In most cases, we can be much faster in uh, understanding what is the good grasp. And actually, the initial results we have, they, they actually prove that. And even in case where the symmetry doesn't exist, we are not much uh, slower than, uh, than the rest. Uh, other thing we do is to um, after we have picked the object, of course, it might be that still the object will slip from the end. And so here, what we do is that we collected the number of, I call it in the wild interactions. So grasping different objects in different poses uh, and collecting the tactile information. And then uh, we create models that are uh, able to detect when the object is slipping in a variety of situations. So whatever the grasp is. And, uh, and this is just uh, one possible application here. You have a tactile sensor. You have a position of the object from vision. You pick it. And then you see from the touch that is slipping. So you put it back, and you try the grasp again. This is really the simplest thing you can do with the, the, the slip detection, but is effective, right? So when you realize that you have a stable grasp, then you can, you can put it 
uh, in composition. Of course, this is important because you want to be aware at all time of the uh, relative configuration between your hand and your object. Because when you want to do things with the object, you assume to know what is the relative orientation between the object and the hand. This is actually true also when we use tools. Uh, very quickly, because I'm going over time, um, when we want to do something more difficult than just grasping objects, but actually we look at manipulating objects in the hand, for example, well, then we take input from human demonstration. And this is very important for robotic applications um, because the idea here is that a human will demonstrate an action, for example, a rotation or whatever movement of the object, and then the robot should learn the generalized concept and then reproduce it with different objects, for example, here, bigger objects, smaller objects. But the other interesting aspect, and, and now we are doing this not by physically moving the object, like you just saw in the previous video, but actually from teleoperation. Uh, the other interesting aspect is that through the system, we can also discover some uh, smart strategies that human use in order to manipulate objects. Think, for example, grasping, uh, like picking an object which is in a dense clutter. Right? You may not be able to fully enclose the object with your finger. You may want to first pick it with two fingers and then uh, pick it with the rest of the finger. And so with this teleoperation system, we, we're trying now to extract these intelligent strategies for, for manipulation that can then be executed by the robot. And interestingly enough, um, something that Yanis mentioned about segmenting this different part of the action based on um, contacts events, uh, this is something that we are looking at uh, from the robotic perspective. Because of course, if you use the human, to do this, then we can detect the content. And just to conclude, the uh, other thing that I just wanted to flesh out, I mentioned how uh, software architectures are important to realize cognitive architectures. And this is something one of my students has worked on. Of course, in Poeticon++, we had a wonderful software architecture that was uh, mainly developed for the ICA. Uh, here, what we do is that we have done something that is a robot agnostic. So it can be used with any robot, which has some kind of uh, ROS, uh, which is kind of a ROS enabled in a sense. And ROS is very uh, widespread now. So um, yeah, just wanted to quickly flesh out this. Uh, yeah, so this concludes my talk. Uh, I presented some of the things we have done in Lisbon in the context of the Poeticon++ project for using affordances to uh, select actions in action planning. And then I mentioned some of the things we are doing here that I think could add something to what we had there, uh, use of tactile representation, learning from humans, and having a general software architecture. Thank you, Lorenzo. Very nice. Thanks a lot. Uh, Jose, Jose, you're up next. I suppose there are some uh, references from uh, what uh, Lorenzo presented as well. Actually, guys, we are half an hour uh, late, so please, everybody, try your best to uh, stick to the time. Okay, thank you. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Okay. <clears throat> well, first of all, it's very nice to be here in the... Sorry. To be... Uh, well, to see so many uh, good friends again and also to share a lot of these discussions that we were privileged to, 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 to have during a number of years uh, during the Poetic and uh, Plus Plus project. So it's, 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 it's very nice to be back to some of these uh, discussions and debates we had. So what I will try to present here is I, I'm sharing the presentation with um, uh, three well, PhD students of mine, they are, they are senior PhD students. So Atabak, Nunu and Paul, so they are here and then they will uh, present some of the slides. And the title I gave to this uh, let's say discussion is Elements Towards Cognitive Architectures and Representations and Interactions. I, I actually forgot the second part of the title, but then Lorenzo reminded me that it was there originally, so I, 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 was, I managed to retrieve it. 
So we are based in Lisbon at the University of Lisbon in a technical the engineering school and our research center is the Institute for Systems and Robotics here in Lisbon. And we are also part of a larger institute of the laboratory of robotics and engineering system that is more multidisciplinary and um, that's it. So I've explained all the logos I have in this first slide. Uh, so this, this is the outline of the, the presentation uh, we have. So I will basically uh, present a little bit of motivation and then uh, provide some ingredients for the discussion. And then uh, Paul will present his part. Atabak will present uh, some of the uh, work in, and ideas about the affordances. And uh, Nunu will discuss some work that we have been doing uh, concerning the interactions and particularly the, the role of gays. It was nice to revisit this uh, image of our uh, architecture in Poeticon Plus Plus. It's really cool. Uh, uh, it was very challenging at the time, and uh, but we made it work, and it had contributions from everybody. So it was very interesting, a very well complex system that we developed at the time. Uh, but the demo that Lorenzo showed, uh, in spite of the apparent visual uh, simplicity, there was a lot of the interesting stuff uh, underlying, so it was uh, very nice to revisit these topics again. So it was also mentioned before that the when we talk about cognitive architecture, the first challenge is exactly to define what cognition is, and, and Lorenzo mentioned this, there are many definitions. That's why I, 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 I chose to refer to ingredients, and I, I believe that we agree that whenever, and, and most of these words were mentioned by other speakers and friends today, uh, when we talk about cognition, there's, uh, I mean, we have to include learning, we have to include anticipation somehow, we have to be able to generalize to a different context and task, so we cannot over specialize on a single context or task alone. Uh, interacting with humans is, is very key and very relevant, uh, so language took a substantial part of the discussion up to here, so all these ingredients are, are very uh, well challenging on their own. Um, but indeed, they are they are key components of I mean, for a cognitive system or a cognitive architecture. They need to be there, and we need to to see how the uh, I mean to to design the interplay between all these uh, ingredients, which is far from being trivial. Of course, I will not provide any let's say uh, propose a solution to this. Um, but I will uh, share with you some of the, uh, along these lines, some of the in ingredients that have been keeping us busy since uh, Poetic and Plus Plus. So Paul uh, will mention um, uh, on what he has been uh, doing about uh, representations. And, and these representations uh, have to be shared across different tasks, in some cases across different uh, individuals. Alessandro also mentioned this when, when I mean, there's interaction, there are these couplings, and in some cases, these uh, representations have to be able to, to, to represent that as well. Uh, affordances have been very well introduced by Lorenzo and others uh, as a gateway for inaction, uh, for understanding the action possibilities and what um, uh, unifying goals and uh, objects. Um, and Atabak will present some of his uh, more recent ideas about this. And finally, uh, interacting with humans and nonverbal communication and reading and writing messages through our uh, movements, as Alessandro very nicely put it, uh, will also, uh, um, I mean, we will discuss a little bit of that also in that last point that, um, that Nuno will, will present. So I will stop here and now ask Paul, so I will stop sharing my screen and ask Paul to jump in and, and do his part. Okay, Paul? Paul, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay, okay. I'll just stop sharing my part. Thank you. Okay. And then I get back in the end on. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, can you see the slides? Okay, I'll assume yes. Yes. Um, okay, so just to frame this, we are in this kind of scenario where we want to interact with another human, this very rich um, task space, which some um, of you also study which is this, uh, a kitchen scenario. And we're perceiving this world with a robot that's walking around the world and perceiving the world with depth and color cameras. And in general, we have very, very few samples for these sort of situations. 
Um, so classically, this, this sort of um, interacting with a human has been approached with an anticipation model uh, where we take the, the information of the world in the form of pixels, um, which has all the weird camera movement in there, all the lightning changes, everything is in there in this pixel information. And we take this and directly from this with, for example, like a transformer or a model uh, we proposed a few years ago, um, we kind of predict what the human will do in the future. So we have the simple model where the prediction is based on a perception uh, we apply our model and get the prediction. But this, when we actually have very few data points, we can actually not really apply such a model. Um, so what we try to argue for is that, can we actually find this layer in between where we extract the semantics of the world and remove everything from camera motion, um, lightning information, um, such that we get a semantic layer that's common across multiple tasks. And so with this layer, instead of having the raw pixels come in directly into the prediction model, what we have is this, this higher form of representation, which was also alluded in other talks. And now the, the big question around is, can we actually find such a, a representation that is task diagnostics? And we try to argue for here is that actually under specific conditions, we can find um, these representations that are task diagnostics and help us in, in further tasks. Um, so then the question shows up, what, what's a good representation? So good representation is one where um, similar objects are actually close by in space, but how do, how do we know this? And this is the big question. How do, how do we know what two objects are similar? So classically this approach by giving a label. So by saying this is a cup and this is a cup as well, our model kind of knows that these two features are close in space. But can we do the same thing without using any sort of labels? Um, so if you look at this sort of representation where we want to represent the world, we want it to be efficient in, in terms of memory because we're trying to capture the world around us. We want it to be invariant to the camera view. So we want to integrate the pixels as we move along with the camera. So as our camera is moving around the world, we want to kind of accumulate what we're seeing. And we want this to be consistent over time. Um, so there are different representations you could attack. Uh, so one is then has proposed here as well, which is this kind of object-centric representations. Um, but in this, we want to argue for this more dense um, 3D voxel-based representation. And so again, this question, can we actually learn features that, that transfer across tasks? And how would we learn such an operator? And so what we argue for here is that actually by having a specific proxy task, we can actually learn features that would generalize to other things. And so in this work, what we do is that we take a single object and we have the same function, the same operator applied from one view and then the same operator applied from a different view. And just by having the constraint that the object should be the same, the classification of the object should be the same, we're able to learn a representation for that object without having any um, semantic information in the form of uh, labels. So, and then with this, just by looking around the static scene, just by walking around and seeing an object from different scenes, um, we can actually learn how to track objects. Okay, time is running out. Um, so, so this is just one, one small part of the equation, which is this, okay, can we actually simplify this, this problem by having um, visual features across tasks? But then of course this collaboration problem has many other parts and Atabak will now go into the next part um, of ordinances. Yes, uh, so uh, I will also try to share my screen. Um, sure. And uh, I hope that it's visible now. Yes. Perfect. Mm. Yes. Uh, so, um, so my my research have been about uh, about uh, learning affordances from interaction. We have seen this happening uh, in children, and uh, and if there is so much information in this child play, then maybe ICAP can also learn. Uh, learn something from similar interactions. Um, but um, so Lorenzo fortunately have explained uh, many of the things that we have done uh, in this area. So I'll try to say some other different parts. Uh, so of course it was part of the Poetican demo in the end, uh, the ideas and, uh, and these systems. Other things that we can do with affordances are um, I'm mentioning some of them. One of them is about prediction of um, of how would object moves with respect to our own actions. This is uh, this is something that that also was mentioned uh, that if if we know an action 
one way that we know an action is about predicting what would happen as the consequence of that action. Um, another way that uh, affordances can be used is, uh, is through uh, effect emulation. Um, because we do not have so much time, I'll try to go uh, faster on this. Uh, so what happens is that ICOP, for example, here, we'll see uh, an effect of someone uh, pushing uh, an object toward itself. So it knows that the effect is the object moving toward itself. And because it understands how its actions would affect objects with different tools, um, ICOP would select a different tool to achieve the same action given those experiences that we had before and also learned to explain and uh, can successfully uh, execute an action that that achieves the same effect as it was as it was observed and uh, the next uh, the next one this one Luciano might remember from uh, the presentation in Lisbon actually we see which is that if we know these affordances we can actually construct objects that uh, we, 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 can, uh, we can find an average of objects that have similar affordances and combine them to build objects that, uh, that have multiple uh, or a mixture of these affordances. Um, but um, one thing that I was not very happy about was that taking actions in real world uh, is costly and also may, may be dangerous. So um, using simulations would speed up this uh, acquiring of uh, knowledge, but obviously simulations have, have issues. Uh, they are not a perfect replication of reality. Uh, in order to see what would be some of the most interesting parts of simulations that we have to investigate for them to be useful for robots acting in real world, um, I again um, use some of Gibson's ideas which he hypothesized that affordances are, uh, are related to objects, surface layouts and material. Um, so I have this, uh, this work where uh, we were uh, changing objects material, their visualization and their position. And uh, we were showing that if we have enough variations in the simulation, uh, we, can, we can probably improve uh, going from here to here, can improve uh, uh, the performance of these computational systems on, on, in this case, detecting objects. So that's one aspect, uh, changing the visualization. And another aspect is the, is the physical part, um, which is um, we can replicate those experiments that Lorenzo showed in simulation, uh, see how the objects be behave uh, in, this, in response to actions uh, and measure, compare them to reality and uh, change the the parameters of the simulation so that from if they don't match, they continue and continue and they come, become closer and closer to what was actually observed in the real world. These are the two components, uh, the, the layout and the physical material uh, that we can learn, we can use those experiences so that it would help us using uh, simulators for real world actions. And then um, another part of the layout is, uh, is uh, the, the shape, the 3D shape of objects. And those ones can also be uh, from the vision, we can, we can build them. Lorenzo was touching on the idea of, uh, of, a, similar, of a symmetry assumption. Uh, it's, th this work is also kind of similar to that. And if we have those, uh, we ha if we have the 3D models of objects, we have a better, uh, Representation, representation of the world in simulation that can help us again uh, doing actions in the real world. And with that, I, I finish this presentation and I give the floor to, to Nuno. Okay, so let me share my screen. Sorry, there is some issue with permissions. Um, uh, no, no, you're co-host. You should be able to share the screen. Yeah, but uh, my Mac, 
Oh, my Mac decided to. Uh, my Mac decided to stop me from sharing for some reason. Uh, we can also revert to Jose's previous plan where. I mean, he shares the screen and okay, okay, no, okay. now no, it's okay. It's fine. Can you, can you see it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So, uh, so sorry about that. Um, so let me just talk a bit about uh, uh, some of the another research that we focus on our group, which is uh, the role of gay cues from humans uh, in understanding actions. So uh, it's been studied for for quite some time that. Uh, the, the gaze cues of humans precedes the motor control of uh, approaching an object to, to perform an action. And uh, so uh, we decided to explore more in depth uh, the, the gaze cues. So we, we, we added, uh, sorry, can you see the video? Uh, we added the eye tracker onto an individual and we asked them to perform some actions of pick and place and handing over. And we, we looked at, uh, at the gaze fixations um, of, um, of, this, of, of, this, of this subject in order to see that uh, they actually precedes its motion. And then if we mimic, if we mimic this, uh, this gaze cues onto a robot and we ask people to guess which action the robot is doing, uh, we, we, we noticed that, uh, the, um, that people would correctly guess the actions of robots uh, as often as they would uh, uh, guessing a, a, an action performed by another human. Uh, then do, uh, throughout this experiment, we noticed that uh, during handovers, it, the, the gaze would precede uh, the, the motion, not just to, to the final end goal, but also to, the, to, to, an, to another type of cues which we noted as a communication cues. So the people were not just looking at the final position to where to put the object in the handover, but also to the, to the human, to the eyes, to the hands. And uh, we then proceeded to extend this experiments by adding two people and, and putting eye trackers on both people and, 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 and looking into the, to the gaze cues of people handing over and picking in place. So, but not also on the active acting motion, but also on the reactive. So then we we had we had we had both both the people both post person handing over, but also the uh, how the reaction of another person that would understand the action from their point of view and how would they uh, receive the object. And so and putting this uh, 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 learning these features and applying this to a human robot interaction, we were able to have a. a uh, a human wearing an eye tracker, and the, the, the gaze cues of the human would be uh, would be would be learned, or would, would the, the robot would know where the human was was looking, and from the from the gaze cues of the human, he was able to understand what type of action the human is was going to do, and at the same time uh, generate its own gaze cues in order to react as a human would react, as seen in the in the human human interactions. So, so then we, ha we have this, uh, this gaze communication part and also the gaze uh, of guiding, of guiding the, 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 the motor movement. And so we wanted to see how would this change by having objects with different properties. And one, one interesting property that we wanted to study was having uh, cups with different levels of water. Because uh, um, as we probably, probably are familiar with, manipulating a cup which is empty is much easier than manipulating a cup which is full of water. And so we, we, we added this again, eye trackers on, on people handing over and picking and placing uh, cups with different levels of water. And uh, we noticed that um, because of the challenge of manipulating cups filled with water, uh, what, what would happen, in, what we would see in the gaze communication part is that there was less time spent on expressing the intent. So less time focused on looking at the other person's face and the other person's hands. So less communication part and more part more more focused on the on the visual guidance part. So more on making sure that throughout the handover the cup was safe and there was no risk of spilling. So we 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 try to use this these features to extend our previous uh, controller and uh, throughout the throughout a new human robot interaction whether the the human would uh, uh, change its behavior during the handover. We try to estimate if in fact the human was having more trouble or less trouble manipulating a cup. So th these are some of, the, some of the different features that we can extract from uh, human, uh, the role of gaze in human-human uh, in interactions. So then I'll pass 
the mic to Professor Jose. Well, okay, I'll share my screen again, and I have just one more slide and then two more slides. Okay, just uh, the discussion. Well, this, uh, I mean, about these architectures that we have seen our reference architecture in Poetic, and of course, there are many others that. Uh, include somehow some of the building blocks that we have been discussing uh, throughout this afternoon. So I've listed here some of the challenges that, 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 that um, I mean, I, I, I see. So one is that I think it's very important, the, the aspect of interdisciplinarity. Uh, if we really want to build a cognitive architecture or understand cognition, I think we are, this workshop is a very nice example of that and Poetic on Plus Plus was a great example of um, working in such an environment, but it's not always the case that we can do that. Then, um, I mean, I think many of us spend a lot of uh, work in the community sometimes uh, developing uh, very specialized skills uh, to the level sometimes of a super superhuman performance. So, but then uh, we devote much less effort to have a more comprehensive view of what uh, our holistic perspective of uh, cognition. So the, I just listed there some, some I mean, I mean the, how to represent the goals, issue of memory that we have discussed, actions, prediction, language. So sometimes we over-specialize a skill, but we are not solving the problem in a more uh, holistic uh, matter uh, way. Uh, and the other thing that, that I think we need somehow um, is to have some sort of uh, metrics and benchmarks. So it's, each time we do some progress in these architectures, or I think it's hard to measure progress because we don't have, uh, I mean, uh, of course, this is long-term research still, but so we don't have standardized, I mean, architectures or blocks. So, it, so it's hard to really to compare what we are achieving compared to what we did yesterday or in the previous project or some colleagues. And it's, I think we need to find ways to, to do that. And this picture, by the way, and then I stop here, is illustrates the way that we try to use this idea of building artificial systems and cognitive systems, also to understand um, I mean, the aspects of human cognition that has been inspiring in these projects and in, in our work and with so many colleagues present here. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jose. It's, uh, I mean, all the your conclusions are uh, very nice, and I think we agree on all these aspects that are really challenging in developing cognitive architectures. Uh, Alex, you're up next, so let's see. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Katrina, for gathering the group again. It's very nice to, to be here and have these interesting discussions. So um, I'd like to share the screen. Okay, so you probably get it. And also, uh, I come from the same lab uh, as, as Jose, so uh, the logos are explained by default now. <laughs> um, and um, so I, and my talk today is about foveal and egocentric vision for robot cognition. So you may wonder what it has to do with Poetican. Uh, so let me say that I, I started working on these topics maybe 20 years ago during my PhD with Jose and also with Julie Sapini. We spent that period, but the, the, the spark that triggered the more recent results that uh, I'm presenting here today uh, are from Luciano Fadiga uh, in one of the Poeticon meetings. Uh, I remember that at a certain point he said, uh, maybe not the exact words, but something like, we are doing this wrong. I have an idea. We should start from the beginning that we have a high with the fovea that forces our eyes to move, and this forces the brain uh, to develop many cognitive skills. And, and it, I, I, I guess you remember, Luciano, thanks for, for the, the spark. And, and this is uh, what I'm trying to do today, is to convince you that uh, foveal and egocentric vision are at the core of cognition and very relevant to the development of the cognitive architectures. Okay, so um, this uh, I'll briefly introduce uh, what, what is foveal and egocentric vision with some uh, examples from, from the past. 
uh, then I will delve into uh, new research um, where foveal vision is used for object detection and visual search processes. Uh, so when objects are not centered in the retina, this puts some challenges and it's where higher cognitive aspects uh, will be highlighted. Then uh, I will describe some work here on uh, trying to understand how foveal vision might have emerged in nature through optimality principles that are at the core of cognition and then some conclusions in the future. Um, so the, um, uh, we start uh, with, with the eyes of humans and, and other primates that are, are foveated, which means they have high acuity in the center uh, of the retina in a region called the fovea, and that spans just a few degrees of visual field. And then the acuity degrades towards the periphery. And because of this, humans have to constantly move their eyes, humans and robots, have to constantly move their eyes to, the, to scan the environment, create a metal representation of the surroundings. Images are constantly moving and objects are perceived in this first person view, which is called the egocentric vision. And this fact demands that the brain develops a uh, short -term, term memory. We have to keep a local stable representation of the world while the eyes are moving. Uh, visual attention to determine what are the salient objects in the field of view visual search in order to define the scan path of the eyes to, to accomplish tasks and, and also uh, gaze-based uh, communication like Jose explained before. It's because we move our eyes and because they expose so much of our goals that eye gaze is, is almost a language between gazing agents, I mean, robots and, and, and humans. Um, so, um, uh, there are many ways to represent uh, foveation. Uh, one of the best known models is the, the, the log polar mapping, so where the image is processed by the retina and subsampled in a pattern uh, whose resolution decays to periphery. This has been proposed by Schwartz and studied by Sandini, Wyman, and others. And this approximates the information processing and, and storage processes in, in the human brain, so we can see the image in the retina and, and then when it goes to the cortex it, it becomes represented in something like a, a radial and angular uh, uh, coordinates so if, if we see this grid overlap on one image then if we unwrap the grid then we have uh, a cortical image or a lock polar image um, so this mapping has interesting properties like the quasi invariance to translations and rotations around the center so translations and, and uh, rotations and zooms around the center become translations in, in the cortical map. And the amount of data stored is several orders of magnitude lower than equivalent uh, uniform resolution uh, image. And then this uh, makes things much more efficient. So the log polar mapping has, has a singularity in the origin because the logarithm of zero is minus infinity, but this is solved with trivial extensions to the model. So uh, using these properties of complexity reduction of foveal vision um, and, and assuming that uh, we are looking at centered objects. So we have demonstrated already in 96, during my PhD, uh, that we could do egocentric vision at 50 frames per second. Uh, and this is only possible because we had uh, very uh, low resolution images. So here you can see a version's behavior that verges in whatever is in the center of the image. Uh, here you see uh, some tracking based on the verged object. So we can segment the object that is in the center of the image and under version. So this is all pre-recognition. We don't need to recognize the objects. And all of this is done very quickly. Then we can also stabilize the image, uh, compensate for translations and, and also for rotations and zoom, okay? But um, so this is what happens in, um, let's say centered objects. Ah, okay, so here's another example from log polar stereo that we also did by the time. I like these slides because they, I was young by the time. So, uh, so now the, the problem is what happens when objects are not centered in the retina, okay? So now the brain has to make choices. It's not just an automatic behavior that does whatever what it has to do with the object in the center. And um, so, the, the key question is, so can we detect objects that are in the periphery 
So uh, because the patterns are blurred and, and, and if yes, how to plan the next decade to search for objects. And so uh, this is the, the purpose of this section. Uh, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, and and it, this video in fact shows some of uh, our more recent models uh, showing here an artificial fovea scanning the image using some uh, information theoretic principles to define the scan points and, and the, the accumulation of information. But so let's uh, uh, talk about a simplification that I'm doing here. So in, in terms of information content, the foveal images are equivalent to, to blurring the Cartesian image with filters that have decreasing bandwidth as we go to the periphery, right? And we have proposed this model based on Laplacian pyramids, where the fixation point here can be configured for any point in an image, simulating a saccade. And we use this in the next experiments for computational simplicity, because so they have the advantage that they are still in a Cartesian coordinates, but with the resolution of the foveated images. And this allows us to use pre-trained neural networks in these images. Uh, and, and then we, we can extrapolate what be the, the, the performance of deep networks that might be trained in, in the, the log polar sampled images. So in these images, the first thing we, we tried to do uh, was uh, looking at uh, um, object classification networks. So um, object classification networks, they uh, try to classify whatever is in the image without a particular uh, localization. But we can exploit uh, interesting properties of, of these networks in which uh, we can uh, back propagate information from the classes that are most salient in the, in the prediction and, and, and identify in the original image what are the pixels that are most more salient. So imagine we have this foveated image where the fovea is here. We can see some dark blob here. We don't know what it is, but it's probably a next good point to, to, to saccade to. Okay, so based on this information, on this saliency information, then we make a saccade to that uh, particular point, and then we can classify the, the object with, with better uh, quality. So we have shown that when one saccade uh, in this work here that one saccade is enough uh, to converge uh, for the dominant object and reach a similar precision to the classification of the original unblurred image. Uh, of course, we are assuming here that we only have one object uh, that is interesting in these images. So what, what if there is more than one object? So now the brain has to decide uh, among different objects, where to what, what are the most interesting objects for a task or for gathering information about the environment. And recently we are testing object detectors. Uh, so object detector networks, they not only categorize uh, the objects, but also locate where they are. So the output of an object detection network is a set of bounding boxes with scores. And they kind of work in, in foveated images with a caveat. So the, the, the objects in the periphery, they have more ambiguity. So they cannot be distinguished so well. So the, the probabilities of the classes are, are more flat. They, they, are, they are more uncertain. Whereas the objects that are more in the center, they, they have sharper um, uh, classifications. So they are less uncertain. Um, anyway, the, the objects in the periphery still have important information. Even the patterns of ambiguities there uh, are interesting for uh, deciding if uh, saccading there is important, is highlighting in some aspect about the state of, of the environment. So we uh, uh, are proposing in, in uh, unpublished work yet, but it's a master thesis to be defended tomorrow, uh, a model where um, we, we kind of capture this uncertainty in the periphery and exploit it to get uh, a better uh, information, probabilistic information, in order to update the, uh, uh, our perception of all objects in, in, in the world. 
So we capture these uh, images and passing them to the YOLO uh, detector. In this case, we get many bounding boxes, each one with some classification scores. These scores are more certain in the fovea, more ambiguous in the periphery. So what we do is to learn in a, a, a prior stage an observation model that captures the distribution of these scores in different parts of the, the visual field. So this is learned uh, as a probabilistic model is, is much faster to learn this than learning a new neural network. And so this will be represented as a Dirichlet distribution to represent the distribution of the scores. So it's kind of a correction. Let's say it's a kind of a correction that we make to the scores given the foveal and the, the blurring in the periphery. Then uh, we uh, have a map that uh, in the world uh, tries to represent the probability of, of each object. And so we, we update the map. The map is also represented with uncertainty. We can decide where to gaze in order to reduce uncertainty overall or to reduce the uncertainty for the search for a specific object. So, um, and then the cycle repeats. Um, so here is, well, just the probabilistic model behind it uh, here, not going to detail, but so the, the, the ambiguity of the detector scores in the periphery is, is learned here on the, the initial uh, uh, distribution parameters for uh, the probability of an object conditioned to its distance to fovea. And then uh, the map probabilities are also uh, Dirichlet probabilities uh, uh, distribution. So there are ways to fuse uh, this information sequentially and have uh, um, an updated map at every time to, to decide where, where to gaze. So this is um, an example of the algorithm working. Uh, we can compare here different methodologies we have trained uh, and tested this in COCO uh, data set and compute here the classification score for different variants of the algorithm. And we can see that active, active perception, so this method that uses uncertainty to decide next point is better than uh, more random, random approaches. And there are also several um, fusion uh, methodologies that you can see here. Uh, but I mean, after the second decade, uh, you see that uh, active perception is paying off because you get more information uh, on the world and uh, you get a, a better uh, uh, way to go. So the robot spends here more time looking at the region where there are more objects and possibly more ambiguities. But uh, so this kind, kind of works. And there are some maps, some probability maps that show the update of the maps as the fovea goes around the, the environment. Um, okay, so uh, in another work, we also use this with uh, stereo vision. Uh, in this case, to um, uh, determine uh, objects in terms of their distance. So the problem here was uh, detecting objects that are closer to the robot for the purpose of obstacle avoidance. And, and here, the uncertainty model, uh, instead of being represented uncertainty on scores of a classifier is, is the uncertainty on the reconstruction, the 3D reconstruction of a point given the matches in the binocular images. So um, again, we compare uh, the performance of Cartesian and, and, and log polar uh, sensors. And the uncertainty in log polar sensors is much lower in the center than in the periphery due to the uh, geometry. Whereas in, in Cartesian images, it's, it's more or less uniform for a constant distance object. And, and this uh, is a key factor in this problem to show the, the advantage of, of the foveated image. So here are some uh, examples of, of scans of the robot. It's difficult to understand as the robot is here, is moving the eyes. And here the point clouds are being fused in the map. Uh, the videos are not very clear, but here the, the plots uh, better reflect the, the different performance between log polar and conventional Cartesian system. So the, the solid lines here are the log polar sensor and the dashed are Cartesian. And we see that the foveal sensor can reach better precision, uh, both overall and at the location of the target. 
and also is able to reduce the gap in, in an uncertainty faster than Cartesian. So this, this is for the same uh, number of, of receptive fields and, and the same field of view in, in both sensors. Okay, so the, the last thing um, I'd like to highlight is um, some, done, uh, some work done on, on finding out how foveal sensors may have emerged in nature from basic optimization principles. And here the main principle we are considering is the ability to predict one's own effect uh, in our perceptions. Okay, so the actions. Uh, and here crickets, they produce some sounds to attract mates and they have to filter their own sound from the others. And worms, they use tactile information to perceive the environment and they understand if they are being touched by others or the, the perception is from their own and, and humans with vision understand if images are moving according to our own actions on the eyes. And the ability to predict um, is essential here. Uh, so when we move our body, we sense translations, rotation, zooms of the objects in the environment. And uh, we can build these triplets of the image before an action, the action and the image after the action and, and create the model, learn a model that uh, is able to, to predict. So uh, what we have done is to uh, develop, okay, so this is the, the effect of the action. What we have done is to create a kind of a, cognitive architecture sort of say that uh, incorporates both the perceptual uh, as the input images and, and motor information. They are blended together in a compact sensory motor representation. Uh, and so this is an unconventional network with some multiplicative gains here. By the time there were no deep learning frameworks, but today's uh, language, this would be some kind of self-attention network. Uh, mixing sensor and, and motor information. And we are learning here how the sensor neurons collect information from the, the retina uh, and also how the motor neurons represent actions. And this is learned only from the data. And this is done also uh, using constraints on the computational neuronal resources to obtain compact representations. So uh, we train this network with a large set of, of experiences. And uh, so what you see here are uh, the, the weights of neurons uh, or, or connections of neurons to retinal locations. So each position here is a retinal location and the color is the visual neuron uh, that is collecting this information. So a ganglion cell or receptive field. And so what we can see is that as the system learns from the data, you uh, see these structures organized in a way that uh, neurons collect data from compact regions of space. And this resembles a, a foveal uh, arrangement. So if we train the system with translations, we see this kind of hexagonal patterns. If we use rotations and zoom, we, we have more uh, polar-like arrangement. Uh, also, if we look at the predictive structures, we can see that the model uh, developed motor primitives that result in the canonical effect of actions in the receptive field. So this is for some translations and this is for the rotations. Okay, so uh, I hope I, I have made a point in, in favor of foveal and egocentric vision as having a central role in developing uh, human-like cognitive skills like target selection action planning, uh, and, and also that these things can emerge from uh, basic optimization principles of, of prediction. Uh, so in future work, I'd like to make some comparisons with human visual search behavior, see if our model has some resemblance and some metrics, and go towards efficient implementations of these methods on the log polar arrays, and also try new deep learning methods to further study the emergence of foveal vision. So if you are interested in these problems, let me know. But thanks. That's it. Thank you, Alex, very nice. Great. Uh, we'll move quickly to Alessandra and Vadim. Trying to catch up with the <laughs> schedule, but. I will try and share my screen. Just let me check if everything works. 
So are you seeing properly my screen? Yes. Very yes. good. So thank you for having me. I am Alessandra Schutti. I work here at the Italian Institute of Technology and I will share the talk with Vadim. I will start by uh, giving, let's say, the, um, the main problem uh, we uh, triggers our research, if you want. So we have seen, we are witnessing a great advantage, advance in, in AI and in bodywear, but yet very, seemingly simple actions, as Lorenzo Yamone pointed out before, are actually the ones that really put uh, uh, problems to our robots and to machines in general. And this is particularly true if we look at situation in which interaction with humans is involved. Those tasks that even to children looks like a very simply feasible uh, look as impossible sometimes to robots, leading to catastrophic failures. So the idea, the inspiration could be that, well, maybe the child could actually represent a very good inspiring point because it could address us to focus on the principal or the minimal skills that are actually necessary to build uh, and develop cognition and uh, also identifying which are the minimal elements in a cognitive architecture that could enable then the emergence of a full-fledged adult-like um, human cognition. And if we look indeed at the development of children, what we realize is that very, very early during development at the very first moments of our lives, we are indeed endowed with a lot of abilities that uh, um, somehow naturally lead us to focus on what matters from a social perspective. So um, as soon as we are uh, born, we are, uh, for instance, sensitive to biological motion, we can detect uh, when something is moving according to biological motions or not, or we are sensitive at whether someone is looking at us or somewhere else. And interestingly, these abilities uh, improve very fast, uh, uh, reaching also very complex uh, um, achievements like, you know, understanding, anticipating the goal of someone else and even helping out when we realize that uh, uh, this goal cannot be achieved. And this before, this is, uh, um, sorry, you might have lost me for a sec, but I'm back, I guess. My yeah, the, the connection dropped for a moment. Yes, but no, I okay. realize. Sorry about that. So uh, long story short, uh, even before the second years of life, we have already uh, developed a very strong abilities that somehow also shape our perception. So when we are looking at the world, when we are looking at someone else, we are not just perceiving, sensing the physical reality for what it is, but our perception is skewed, is deformed through an anthropomorphic lens, if you want. So we are biased to notice what matters for us to successfully interact with the world and successfully interact with others. And uh, this uh, evidence of the fact that we are shaping um, on the basis of our body and of our experience, the perception of others and the world uh, um, is very well exemplified by the case of mirror neurons that was mentioned before by Luzano, of course. So the idea that uh, to understand others, uh, what we do is leverage on a sort of vocabulary of internal models that we are actually have uh, developed by acting. This means that when I'm looking at Carlo passing me a plush, I don't see the mere transportation movement but I immediately infer and understand other more complex and hidden aspects like uh, what is Carlos' goal and even what is uh, uh, Carlos' attitude toward me and toward the object. This is just one example of the very rich kind of embodied communication that we exchange all the time and that allow us to continuously perform actions together by establishing shared goals and intention by exchanging sometimes even without the need for talking, uh, a lot of information about uh, ourselves and the other. Of course, it's a very complex uh, integration of multiple signals that to us come so natural that we are not even aware of. And therefore, we believe that having a robot, and in particular a humanoid robot, can indeed provide a strong help in this effort 
really because we can uh, try to investigate the interaction while it is happening by controlling one element of the interaction, not only controlling what the robot does, but also what it perceives and also how it reacts. So the, an, we believe that an important step toward um, you know, better robots in general and better cognition in general is to enable the robots to leverage on this uh, uh, exchange on these subtle signals, on this embodied communication that we carry on. And this is a bi-directional kind of exchange because it requires robots and machines to see as we see, so to read these implicit signals. But at the same time, it's as important for the robots to be um, aware of how we perceive the world and therefore behave by using the very same signals in a proficient way. To give just a concrete idea of what this means in terms of research. So for instance, we have tried to develop um, a model that allowed the robot to detect as newborns do whether a motion is performed by a biological agent or not. And without a priori knowledge about uh, the shape of the agent. And, and this uh, is nice because um, Starting with this uh, very simple, you know, newborn inspired skills, we notice that the very same model scales up well and then supports uh, more complex social skills like uh, action understanding across view or coordination in timing with other agents. And again, from the observation of, uh, of the motion, and here I think I call. Uh, link myself very well with what the Nuno was presenting about moving fragile objects. Uh, we didn't look at the eyes in this case, but we looked at the motion itself. And we uh, realized that just by observing how a person moves, it is possible for the robots to detect whether the object to be moved uh, is uh, to be treated carefully or not. And this is of course interesting because just without the need of witnessing or recognizing the nature of the object, the robot can infer how the object should be moved. And when it is its turn to move, it can generate emotion that reflects the very same features. And these are, of course, just a few examples, but there are a lot of more uh, signals that we can use. Uh, also, gaze, of course, is super important. To facial expression, even just the pupil dilation can reveal, for instance, the cognitive load of another person. And all this information can be precious for a robot that wants to understand who <laughs> is in front of its eyes. On the other hand, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we think that it's very crucial that also the robot puts an effort to be understandable from the eyes of the partner. And if we can leverage the very same mechanisms that our brain is used to use with human-human interaction, maybe we could simplify that and make it very natural for the human partner. And as an example, I want to just give this little study on expressing attitudes. One very basic ability we all have is to recognize if the person in front of us is passing us an object in a very calm and nice way or in a very aggressive and imperative way. And uh, we are very good at understanding it because our brain is rooted to do that. There is a part of our brain, in particular the insula, that is strongly involved at detecting the style of an action. And what we found was, uh, can we have robots that move in a way that transmit the very same level of attitudes. And it is not easy. So capturing the features that really express that it's not trivial, we discovered. But when you do, the beauty is that you can evoke in the brain of the observer very similar activation as the one that you observe when this person is interacting with a human, which means that we can, even if we're using robots, uh, res uh, resort or reuse uh, circuits that are born to uh, allow a an efficient interaction with humans. And this has also interesting and very clear uh, behavioral impact. Because if the robot is acting imperatively to me, uh, then I start uh, without awareness to move faster, to react, to mimic in some sense, to mirror also the style of the action of the partner. So again, this is an example. There are a lot of other things that we can communicate just by manipulating the way the robot moves. 
um, the gazing, it came out of this uh, as uh, revealing the goal of the, uh, the robot, but even the commitment. I can induce the child or an adult to be more committed to the task he's tending to just by showing the robot expressing more commitment in its participation to the task. So uh, I believe that uh, this uh, avenue of research uh, is very rich and uh, there is still a lot to be um, guessed or understood better about uh, all of these streams of communication. On the other hand, uh, this can't be enough. I think it came out very clearly uh, that uh, what we need is something more. Uh, um, a lot of words came out today and underline the importance of memory or of internal simulation or motivation, all uh, these components that really enable to make sense of this sensory motor information on a wider scale and in the context of prolonged interaction with the robot and from the robot to the world. And indeed, we are trying to explore this possibility, integrating our little sensory motor mechanism within small architectures that enable the robots to either adapt to individual interaction styles or being mindful of the state of the partner and so individualizing or personalizing uh, learning or teaching context. Um, and this, I think, is, is the uh, avenue to, to, to pursue, to really look at this idea of a cognitive architecture basic with uh, basal core cognitive abilities on which to build upon. Um, one thing, one consideration that came to me is that, uh, however, although there is already a very long and very nice uh, series of cognitive architectures, um, if we look at the core abilities that emerge from the cognitive architecture developed so far, um, the social component, the affective component doesn't stand out. So it's always perceived or comes in several architectures, but it's not considered as one of the core cognitive abilities. Whereas if we look at a certain, at the development of the child, where we have seen that this social or affective component are so crucial to bootstrap a lot of other abilities. And uh, we consider also some uh, recent sort of uh, consideration from, from neuroscience. There are um, researchers that are postulating also the possibility of a changing paradigm in perspective for which uh, um, the, the real cognition doesn't, uh, social cognition doesn't emerge from individual cognition, but rather the opposite perspective could, uh, could be meaningful as well. And indeed, what we are noticing is that with the, our experiments is that indeed even basic mechanisms like perception are modulated, change when uh, they are embedded in an interactive scenario. So when the social component is put in and even basic approaches to machine learning might try, have or receive benefits by integrating um, social constructs within the basic mechanism of learning. So for instance, uh, we explore the possibility to integrating mood or rivalry in reinforcement learning algorithms for competitive games uh, in addition to the, the traditional performance metrics. To, to conclude um, my part, and well, the, the general aim of this, uh, this cumulative effort is really to that of creating more humane robots. Uh, that is robots that are more considerate of the human they have in front and they can, they put an effort to, to see the world through our eyes and adapt to us. And uh, just to show, this is the works that I briefly mentioned that are actually a result of a work of a, lots of great people that are working with us and of course of the robots. With that said, I would like to leave the stage to Vadim. Let me find, voila, okay. a way to stop sharing. Voila. Hi, Vadim, you're muted, though. I know, but there was somebody passing that was doing a lot of noise, so I was still wanted to avoid it for you. I'm sorry for the live scenery, but I'm outside at an event. Otherwise, it's a mess inside. They're doing a lot of uh, sound tests, and, and it's, uh, well, on my side, just to uh, make things a bit simpler. So I'm guessing you're seeing the screen now? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so the work here, oh, the, the, from the 
people from Poetico know that I'm a, a robot uh, or, or more infrastructure, software infrastructure um, person. And this is why um, I would like to change a bit the topic and, and try to um, propose some new architecture that we can use in order to actually collaborate. So, and collaborate in doing uh, really nice uh, cognitive architecture like we've done um, in the past and I will go. So basically um, the idea is I would, people who actually have the robot or use the robot um, can kind of relate to what I'm saying now is the fact that um, if you share um, a common robotic platform, okay, so consider not really ICA, but any kind of robotic platform, right, in your um, research lab, and you have um, a lot of people using it. So that means that you have um, a lot of people needed to run their experiments and they have the specific requirements. So they will have to um, go to this, uh, to this platform and actually change uh, hardware, change configurations, uh, modify, install custom libraries and so on. So um, there's a lot of, if you pass the term time wasting in, in the fact that um, somebody goes there to run his experiments, but find that the setup has been compromised in a way. So it would not be able to, it will first have to resolve the system, make sure that everything is clean and then run his own experiment. So it loses maybe hours um, trying to do that. And it's not, um, the case, the, the ideal case scenario, let's say. And this doesn't always happen on, on iCubs, uh, but you can have it even if you run things on, on, a, on a simulator with other robots uh, using YARP, using ROS or whatever. So um, whatever happens, it's, it's very, you can compromise the system, let's say. Um, so let's take a blast from the past. Everybody showed this uh, super architecture that we made for the Poetic and Plus Plus. So if you remember when we were kind of integrating things together, um, it, we spent weeks in, in changing things and making things work together, right? So we had a lot of, uh, it was kind of tough um, working on things. Um, and it was, and if somebody new came into the, the, the game, uh, maybe a new partner or something is that it was very daunting for them. So there was um, a lot of heavy, uh, things to learn, a uh, very high learning curve. Uh, the same people needed to be there in order to make sure that things worked properly in a sense and, and so on. Um, so um, the idea is that we have uh, a need to have a, a clean environment. So for people to run their application um, in a clean environment without really caring about uh, resetting everything and, and doing everything. But we also need to simplify um, the user experience uh, with the robots. So I think I jumped the slide maybe, or I'm not showing it anyway. Um, so our idea basically between this is the fact that, okay, this is oversimplified, but you can imagine in the background what's happening. Um, we basically um, use some, um, in, on top of the YARP, on top of the ROS architecture, we can use, we use some technologies which are called the Docker, Docker Impose, and Swarm that is able to actually um, deploy on any kind of cluster that you have around your robot, so any kind of system. So you can deploy on your robot, you can deploy on a simulator, you can deploy on, on many clusters of machine. Sorry about the ambulance, but it's, um, I don't know, it's terrible. Okay, so to go with, um, to continue, so there's three main ideas behind this for the collaboration. Um, it's the fact that the first one is the thing that you hear the most, especially when you see that some issues happen, is the fact that the, the reply is always, ah, this works on my machine. So we want to avoid this thing of, ah, it doesn't work on or but it works on my machine. And, and it's actually a play for your developer team. Um, we're trying to have um, something that can, something that can build once and run everywhere. So I can build it on my machine, then give it to, a partner, I don't know, uh, anywhere in, uh, in Portugal, a partner in London, a partner in Maryland, so I can, I can do this. And I configure it once and I can run anything on that machine. So whatever I do, I configure it, then I give it to, to a partner, he can run it, he can just by a simple uh, deployment, he can actually run the same software as is on the machine. Um, in the last two years, we worked a lot on, on this building this infrastructure. Uh, we made a lot of uh, applications that are basically this infrastructure of deployment that I was telling you about that you can even 
have this one click thing. So you have this GUI happening, you run it, and then there's the whole cognitive architecture that runs out of magically, automatically, let's call it out of the box, right? Um, so this aids um, the fact of new people coming in to play with things. Um, you can repeat experiments easily. Um, you can actually work and, and do things, collaborate in such a way that it's super easy with the least amount of time, right? Um, so if we consider this, um, this slide that I showed the, a few slides ago, um, where you have, well, the, the object recognition part, let me call it the verbal request, and we have the memory, let's say, that has been presented in the past. Um, we can use this technology in order to have basically these four uh, distinct bits working as deployments. So it's, um, sorry, let me just... Course they have to pass right now. Um, but you had the deployment uh, happening on, on the verbal analysis, so I can take that work from um, any partner, run it there, take a deployment from any other partner, run it there, work, work with them in, in collaboration, and then just with a simple click, have it running with no problem on my robot. So this can happen on, uh, we've been using this technology to run things on, on the iCub, uh, NR1, uh, but this is not limited to this uh, infrastructure, so we can actually use uh, this kind of deployment on, on uh, various uh, robots. So this is to just to give you an idea of what can the technology be developed and what we can uh, uh, implement here. Another last... Uh, Another last uh, slide that I want to show is that we also built something from the, for the community. This is more ICAB related, but um, it can be useful to share the research there um, and have also this kind of, um, call it a store, it's not really a store, but like a container of all the apps that one person can actually um, download on his, um, from this website on the cluster and run it with a simple click of a button. So uh, minimize stress, minimize, um, the, the, the difficulty of using something, uh, you can run these things on, even on a compromise, call it, system, because this does not use this, the, um, the host machine, let's say, it uses its own infrastructure. Um, so this was just um, the idea that we wanted to, to talk about and, and start, you know, proposing things that we might use this also in the future um, with you guys in, in building this uh, nice uh, collaborative uh, cognitive architecture. That's it for me, I think. I didn't waste time. Sorry again about the noise and the scenery. But, uh, that's, uh, I <laughs> no worries. Thank, thank you for giving the presentation, actually, in, in yeah, thank those you. conditions. Very nice. Presentation from uh, enemy territory. Yes. <laughs> from the war uh, front. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Vadim. Thank you, Alessandro, as well. Very interesting uh, developments, and uh, indeed, it will be great to uh, collaborate and use the new um, uh, architecture that you have been building, and also to include the social aspect, as Alessandra said. Uh, last but not least for uh, today's event, we have uh, Angelo, Angelo Controlosi. Uh, hi, Angelo. Hello. We are late as usual, but uh, I think this was expected in a way. Uh, yeah, you are so, on time for the British time. I speak you see? <laughs> yes, we wanted to, to synchronize with you. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if you were on time. Yes, it's 5.30 <laughs> my time, not yours. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's, again, it's nice to see you all. And the next time we must meet uh, in Athens or Portugal. Sure, or we should. Place. We should. Okay, my talk is going to be slightly different from my usual contribution to grounding, uh, like I used to do in like, Poetic On, but it's an evolution of that. Same uh, developmental approaches, uh, more movement towards social, like Katerina said, so it connects nicely with the work that uh, Vadim and Alessandro and the others have presented. So I've had a project for a while. I think this was in parallel with Poetic On++, funded by the US Air Force, where they have a program on trust and influence. And they founded a project called Thrive One, Thrive, that then became Thrive Plus Plus, like Poeticon. I do have my Plus Plus project. 
And here, there were two lines of research. The idea was to combine theory of mind and trust in the human robot interaction in general. Uh, and in particular, we are looking at two aspects of theory of mind. You have a, an artificial theory of mind that the robot builds about the people with whom uh, it interacts, but people, as you say, agents, these are humans or robots. And then we also look at another aspect of theory of mind, which I think is more closely related to the work that uh, Alessandra and the others are doing, which is on people's theory of mind of the robot capability, and therefore, how can this be used to trust the agents? Within this approach, especially for the artificial theory of mind model for robots, we are using a developmental approach. There are different levels of theory of mind we are analyzing. And again, we are using Bayesian models, and maybe this is indirectly a contribution of my collaboration with the people in, uh, for example, Portugal, Jose and, and colleagues. And you will see examples of both computational models and, and experiments, and a small link directly to language grounding of some, which was the initial inspiration, how did I combine trust with uh, theory in mind and with large language grounding. I'm going to show you three, I think, parts of my talk. Uh, oh, is it 15 minutes, right? 15, 20 minutes? Yes, yes I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first part is uh, not directly related to theory of mind, I say towards the theory of mind. This is work done by Samuel. He was connected uh, at the beginning, one of my former PhD students and now a postdoc with me. Uh, this was work funded by Honda, so Christian Gehrig, Honda Research Institute in uh, uh, Europe in Germany, and this funded uh, Samuel's PhD studentship, which finished uh, about a year ago. So the inspiration came, uh, you know, this again resonates with the work that uh, Luciano and others are doing, and also Alessandra, when you were at iTalk, I think, uh, on intentional reading or mind reading from uh, actions. So classical experiment here, you can infer or imply what the person is going to do, then let's say the goal of the action, by the shape of the hand and, and other cues, including, of course, social games. And you will see how this will be integrated in our approach. So what Samuel developed, he used a hierarchical cognitive architecture for uh, intention reading, where there was a low level, which was about uh, clustering in an unsupervised way, a set of actions. The actions, as you will see in the next slide, comes from skeletons of the body, upper body, really. And then there was a higher level, which was a probabilistic uh, Bayesian model that tries to combine sequent clusters and sequences of clusters into specific action goals which were the intention that people were determining so this is what this is samuele you did some experiments on collecting the uh, you know the skeleton and then you can do normal clustering uh, or different uh, postures right to try to identify some commonalities we do something similar for gaze, but this was the second part of the paper. So the 19 paper was motion only, 20 was uh, additional social cues, and then 21 we added a component of trust. So a classical representation of clusters from skeletons and body postures are, are for example, these three examples here, which might correspond, you will see in the video, in different goals of actions. So let's look at the video. The task is building, let's say, structures or, or goals. There's a training phase. Show me the rules of the game. I will learn them so that we can play together. So you give a demonstration. The only thing that counts here what in this specific model show me? is the movement of the person. Do you want to show me another go? Object yes. properties is okay, not really then used in this example. Let's continue. So there are four aims or structures. Data collection in the training, clustering, hierarchical Markovian type clustering for sequences. We are building a tower. Some way the robot predicts the next uh, actions basically by pointing in this case, and then we didn't implement uh, any grasp. But there was a, a we a, are building a castle, so predicting the goal, and then of course, uh, gaze in this case for the action to do. 
So a, a bit of a trick of the trade, you might have heard here, the sound switching between uh, noisy ICAP uh, power supply and silent uh, speaking of the ICAP. I need to confess why this is happening. So the first version of the interaction was with the old uh, speech uh, synthesis system used in ICAP, which I didn't like much. So I asked somewhere, I said, at least for my videos, please overlap a, a nice and also a, a childlike voice. This is why you, if you were paying attention, you would have noticed the change in sound between the speaking and the actual background noise. So this is what uh, Samuel did, and now Samuel is going to extend this to multi hybrid teams of robots and people. So more than two. We typically look at uh, why a person and a robot and how they interact. What happens if you have a third person, which is, for example, collaborating with, in the task or a third robot? The example that comes from Honda is if you have a passenger in a car observing and participating indirectly or implicitly in the interaction between the driver and the semi-autonomous systems, assisted driving, how can we increase the, the well-being and aspects of social interaction when you have more than one robots using this kind of architecture, which is what Samuel is working on at the moment. And then this is mostly work focused on the US funding project, Thrive. It's how can we use robots, artificial theory, or mind cognitive architectures so that the robot can trust, let's say, the human teacher or the master. In the classical developmental approaches, which uh, I always follow, we take inspiration from uh, experiments and theory in children. So there is this famous uh, task from, uh, it's called the Salian task or false belief task. You run a cartoon with children, you show two cartoons, Sally on the left and Anne, two locations. Sally hides a, a marble, a toy in the basket here. She runs away, she goes away. The naughty Anna, I say, swaps the object when Sally's away. And then there is the test phase for the children. To evaluate their level of maturity of theory of mind, you ask the children at the end, in a static cartoon frame, where will Sally look for the object, for the marble, when she returns? And they show that children which are early in development, three, four years of age, the majority, or actually none, uh, realizes that Sal is going to look for the object in the basket because they know, and they think Sally knows that the object is in the box here. Of course, later in development, the majority is six to nine, in the intermediate ages, there is an increased uh, amount of children that do this. Very classical task. And in particular, there are here two levels of theory of mind, no theory of mind, and theory of mind. You will see later there are other components of developmental theory of mind, mostly theory. So here is some information on the statistic of the Bayesian network. So for each participant, you have a, a Bayesian network that looks at probabilities between the opinion that you have of the person and then your own view of the world, and you integrate these and uh, we do some training with this uh, MLE uh, parameter uh, uh, tuning. We are going to look at two replication of child experiments with the robot here, the ICAB and then the paper. In particular, there was a paper by Koenig and Harris where they showed that uh, you there were experiments where a teacher, actually two types of teacher, trustworthy expert teacher or non trustworthy teacher were teaching children new names, which is similar to what we were doing in word learning at the time of uh, era with Tony Morris and so on. There's a familiarization phase, you interact with the people and then you start to apply this. So the video you see here implements the old epigenetic robotics architecture that we had, adapting this to the component of trust. To make it easier, all the actors here are Italian students. So Massimiliano, the, the guy who did the work for the PhD, here is the air architecture, demonstration, vision, uh, acquisition of the mapping between objects. This is a dog. So red t-shirt indicates a non-trustworthy person. So the robot has a name for this. So it creates this theory of an unreliable person. So Marta is reliable. There is consistency between what you are teaching me and what I know. So I update my prediction of you as a trustworthy person. Okay. Now, what happens if I'm teaching the robot a new word, which is not already in its own uh, uh, mapping architecture? And what happens if I have two people teaching me okay. two different names for the objects? So when uh, the parent comes back to test the child, Massimiliano. What is this? 
I think this is a tax. Okay, so what you get here is a, you will see in the next video some comp components of explainable AI. You start to get the child that gives you an opinion. In this case, uh, I mean, they think it's a bit artificial, but it would indicate a probability level. So this is what we initially did. I was doing my stuff on, uh, a, you know, AI architecture. So it made sense to link this world learning to the trust architecture. Now it's a slightly different example. It's the same task, but instead of having a cartoon shown to children here, a one built in San Diego played a game where the parents and or the experimenter, the child were putting stickers left and right, hiding them and guessing where they were. So same architecture, different task. Uh, here we did more a more extensive analysis of aspects of uh, interaction with people of different levels of trustworthiness. So you play a game, the trigger label, helper label is for us, it's not for the robots. The robot is an implicit acquisition of, of let's say, probabilities of being trustworthy. Right. And now we do a decision making. You use your knowledge to apply this to a new interaction task. So that's the probability table. Next one is a with a person you've never seen. You will apply your history of interactions to predict a possible behavior. And finally, here is the work on uh, explainable AI. So we know it's important if you can explain why you are choosing left or right with you know making explicitly transparent to the participants what you are deciding. This uh, helps improve task uh, trust and so on, which is a, a big line of research at the moment. Trust and explainable AI. How much time do I have, Caterina? Five minutes or less? Uh, five minutes is fine. Five yes. minutes. Yeah. So the final computational model, which is being uh, just submitted a paper, it's on using a deep learning architecture proposed by DeepMind for uh, trust, where there is a similar implementation of this uh, false belief game, where you, you the, in their way, is a maze task, an agent in a two-dimensional uh, grid world. Here we have the ICAP performing a similar task on a table. You have a paper that observes the ICAP, and then sometimes you can hide the location of the goal and you can guess what the person is doing, similar to when Sally goes away and you hide the location. Uh, this is done on simulation. This is COVID time, so we couldn't do initially stuff on the ICAP. Uh, and uh, then some analysis of the effects. So we can show that, of course, lower performance, but you still get attitudinal level. Let me explain. In developmental theory of, of theory of mind, there are three levels that children go through in uh, the stage towards a full uh, uh, theory of mind. One is actional, you know, sorry, one is mechanical. You know the objects interact physically in certain ways. So if I have a round ball and I hit it, it will roll. If I have a, a, a cube I, and I hit it, it will move slightly or will move depending on the weight. Then there is actional level. You identify the goal of the action. So if I hit, a ball to roll, roll becomes uh, the goal that you want to achieve. And then you have attitudinal level. The intention that you want to apply to achieve a specific action using specific mechanical mechanisms. So three levels of implementations. Here we are analyzing these two. And you will see in the next slides, the next final part of the talk, which is about the people's theory of mind of the robot. How can I trust, how human can I trust the robot? Here we are going to analyze high priming certain capabilities, a theory of mind capability in the human participants by watching a video can elicit a certain type of trust. So we have a game where you prime the robot showing the two videos I'm going to uh, have in the next slide. Then they play a game. It's an investment game or it's a selling game. And the amount of money you invest or you use for your selling game will tell you an indication of trust. So these are two videos that participants see 
we first did a face-to-face -face experiment and then COVID came and now we're doing this online. But let's look at the video. It's a description of the salient task. And I'm Anne. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Okay, I'm just going to press this keyboard because I don't Okay. Okay. Um, I've just got to pop out. I'll be back in a minute. See you. See you. Samuel is, is a famous actor. He's always there. Yeah, she's gone. I'm going to get the cube from her cup. And I'm going to move it under my cup. Okay. Where do you think she will look for the cube when she's back? Wait, let me think. So well, this is just a priming. She did not see that she knew the cube, so she is going to search under the cream cup. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, let's get some. Oh, where's my cube gone? Okay, so you have these two videos. The other video is uh, different. You know, there is no concept of theory of mind for the robot. You run the game, and we demonstrated that if you interact with a robot, which doesn't have a full theory of mind capabilities, your level of trust is less. So this is one of the components that influences people behave. And then I conclude with some technical information on a new project, which is, it's actually a new program funded by the UK RI, the UK Research Council. Uh, it's a 30 million investment. They funded the hub, a larger project that gives uh, money in suburb projects. And then they funded also six nodes, and one of the nodes is the one in which I'm involved. This is a node on trust, the human-robot interaction or cognitive modeling aspects. And the goal here is to model an extended version of this uh, probability theory of mind. This is done in collaboration with uh, Helen Hasty, who is the uh, leader of the whole node. She's part of the area of what Edinburgh Robotics. Me in Manchester, and you all know, Yanni Demiris is in Peter. And these are our postdocs. Actually, I should add a fourth co-investigator, Tusha is a professor of child psychology and theory of mind experts in uh, the area of what also. And these are some of our postdocs, including Martha for us here. And the idea is that you do cognitive modeling, this is my work package, and then you do uh, personalization of the interaction, this is Yannis, and then you look at validating this in experiments. In this project, we want to make it a general architecture that goes from uh, working remotely with robots, marine robots, or nuclear robots, and then my domain, human-robot interaction, close proximity, and then healthcare, where you have, for example, a wheelchair with a robot in it. Okay, let me conclude by reflecting on, on where we are with this approach. So we still follow a developmental approach. In particular, here, we're looking at different level of trust. So we move towards a social elements with a link to language grounding, at least at some point. Theory of mind is proposed as a general social interaction architecture. And uh, now it's important to look at ethical aspects. So if you have this kind of system, you can go towards human-centered uh, AI systems or human-centered robotics. And I think open challenges, we, we all know where we are. And, and I'll stop here to give time for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. Very nice, very interesting. Um, I know it's, it's late. Uh, but um, any thoughts, comments, uh, to start a bit the discussion, I would say that um, as I was uh, listening to all the presentations today, um, I realized that we are ready to, to collaborate on a, on a new cognitive architecture with um, really improved uh, modules with many different aspects that we didn't have in Poeticon. Um, including trust, theory of mind, including social aspects that we didn't have before, and uh, with more advanced uh, visual modules, interaction modules, and so on. So this is something for food for thought, I would say, at least, uh, from today. Um, any other comments, guys? Yanni, Luciano? I, I have a comment. Julio, yes. Angela, yes. Katerina. The new Horizon program, at least the call, uh, it's too near the call, but I don't know about the coming one. There is room again for poetic on type cognitive architectures with lower TR level. So maybe mm -hmm. this is something we should consider. Indeed. At some point. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, I agree. Can I just make a, a comment, which I think, I mean, uh, 
uh, I, I enjoyed every peak. Okay, so that's. Uh, but I want to stress the fact that one thing that that, that I think pops out, at least for me, uh, is the remark that uh, uh, Lorenzo Yamone made, uh, you know, about uh, uh, the need to think about uh, uh, when we discuss about cognitive architecture, uh, to think about uh, thinking versus doing, mm -hmm. uh, which I think you know it relates to the fact that you need to be able to do actions and to to imagine actions. You know all these uh, which are behind uh, neural neurons and, uh, and you know and, and everything and, and and everything else. So in in some sense maybe these. I mean of course there will be. Uh, thousands of things to discuss, but I think that this uh, may be, you know, a, a good summary. I mean, we need an architecture which can be used to think about movement, but also to, to about doing actions also, not only, uh, you know, thinking about actions, but also doing actions. And in this respect, you know, the, the three levels that uh, Yanis described uh, about, uh, about actions, uh, uh, and the first one, if I recall, was uh, uh, being able to, re uh, to understand by looking or something like that. Uh, and I think that uh, I would attach uh, uh, to the word understanding uh, the ability to do the actions. Uh, otherwise, it is just recognition, which is a vision thing, is not a cognitive thing. Uh, and, and, and this, uh, I think, goes very well with uh, thinking versus uh, versus doing, uh, you know, as Lorenzo was, uh, was mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, that's my, my short comment, but I mean, I enjoyed uh, everything. Maybe we, maybe we should uh, uh, reserve uh, one hour for discussion at some other time. And because, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, I think that would be a good idea, yeah. Yanni, what do you think? Uh, it was for me, you know, having all these memories from the Poetico and then listening to all these interesting ideas, it was a very nice experience. Uh, and uh, I, it reinforced my belief uh, from the things that uh, Luciano talked about he referred to motor concepts and motor ideas. So I believe it is time. And if you combine this with uh, what Julio just said, I believe it is time that we, we actually built a system for reasoning and thinking about actions. I mean, we have been thinking about systems for representations for doing the actions. Now we have to extend it so that we can think about actions and we can relate the actions and the motor ideas to the concepts, mm -hmm. which is really the missing step from AI today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there has been this recent controversy with uh, foundation models, the people at Stanford, uh, about 100 people, they got together and they announced that the future of AI is what they call the foundation models. And these models are these uh, very large uh, over parameterized uh, models with billions of nodes, transformers, that they mm -hmm. use mostly for natural language, for translating and yeah. predicting and, and producing and all of that. Uh, and they think that this is the future, that now we can take this as a foundation and we can build on that. And they had a workshop and a professor from Berkeley attacked them uh, that they call them foundation models, but they are castles on, made on sand because they do not depend on sensory motor intelligence, that they are only focusing on language. Mm -hmm. So there is this, you know, many people in AI think of AI in a disembodied manner. 
Uh, and, you know, as time goes by, unless we really take this seriously, uh, AI will be in trouble. I want to refer to you, there's a book just published by a guy called Larson, called The, the Myth of Artificial Intelligence, mm. where he, he talks about deduction and induction, like deduction is, you know, the traditional approach to AI, top-down symbolic models. Induction is the machine learning approaches where you go from examples to generalize. But what is missing is abduction, which is uh, basically the development of hypotheses that you make continuously about the world and reasoning to figure out what is going on. This is another way to uh, describe this is common sense reasoning. Yeah. And so that is missing as well. And I believe that without considering the ideation of action, that is thinking about actions and doing simulations and imaginations, uh, we cannot do common sense uh, reasoning or abduction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. So very nice. I'm, I'm happy from the, the point of view that we still, I mean, the group of us, we're still subscribing to this notion of the motor system being very fundamental in cognition. And that gives us a little edge over the rest of the community that have, have completely abandoned the notion of the motor system in the quest for intelligence. And they think that deep networks would be enough to, you know, produce solutions. But these deep networks, you know, the only thing they are doing is associational kind of learning, Pavlovian. And that's not bad because, you know, you can use it. There's no question about that. But uh, it's, a, it's a part of the story. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Can I, can I make a short comment? Because, uh, 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 yeah, I think in the robotics community, the fact that uh, eventually we want robots to do things, I think is uh, is well established, right? But the problem is that from from the most people in, in that community, the idea that actually a robot that learns how to do things can help us to understand cognition is something that uh, maybe doesn't doesn't come natural, right? And in that sense, uh, I I would like to uh, relate this to the community of uh, ICDL conference, uh, in which actually these topics are often discussed, and uh, I will be chair for next year in London. And we hope to do uh, in-person conference. And uh, apart from inviting you to participate in any way you like, uh, maybe it could be also an option to have, uh, let's say, a, po a poetic on a re reloaded workshop. <laughs> and if anybody wants to take the initiative, I think that could be a, an interesting venue to do such a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you, Lorenzo. It's, it's good that you mention robotics. You know, I want to relate to you an experience I had. Uh, recently, uh, I don't remember exactly when, Francesco Nori from uh, DeepMind gave a, a talk in the ICOG series. And he said that for him, the fundamental problem of robotics is the ability to massage the data that exists today so that it can be digested by robots so that they can learn how to do things. Mm -hmm. This is the sort of modern machine learning view of a roboticist, okay? So that happened, I believe, on a Thursday. 
the following Monday, OpenAI, this famous uh, group of people that uh, are trying to do, you know, amazing things, abandoned its effort on robotics. <laughs> they said, yes. they yes. said, no more. We're not going to do this because we cannot use data to get it ingested by the robots so that they can learn to do things, not in the near future. So what they were saying is that what Francesco was arguing for, they cannot do it in the near future. No. What is, what is your view on this problem? Because today, most roboticists, they want to learn things. They, they want to, to develop solutions where the robot learns how to do things. And they want to do it almost automatically. They want to figure out data sets and so on and so forth uh, so that the systems will learn. And what is your opinion about robots learning in simulation with millions and millions of trials, especially these problems on reinforcement learning, where they're doing them in simulation and it takes millions of trials and, and weeks of training, and then maybe it may translate to the real world. Yeah, yeah. What short, is your opinion? Yeah, short opinion is that I think there is a, uh, a lot to gain from uh, looking at the uh, uh, let's say how humans develop uh, and uh, the the so the way they collect data, the way we as human collect data uh, by choosing interesting strategies to get the data, and which can in turn be robots that need less data in order to learn the same thing. Uh, nobody really knows how to do it because otherwise we would have done it. Already. And actually, the, as you say, the approach of uh, most of the robot learning community is instead to try and understand how to learn in simulation and then transfer to real world, which also doesn't work too much. I mean, it works in specific settings to what I know and to what I've seen. I'm not sure what's the best way forward. I prefer to think that maybe there is no best way and both things can go forward and give interesting results. But at least there is something to gain in uh, trying to understand useful strategies uh, to, to collect data in real world so that it can be less good. Uh, but this is just a short comment that would be we could talk about our so. a long workshop to do this. <laughs> if I may, if I may say something, yes. may I? May I? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, as it happens uh, frequently, I fully agree with Yannis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean that. Uh, I mean that uh, the key point, but I, I'm really convinced about that. The key point is that what also Giulio was saying. This integration between uh, the acting uh, and the perceiving, uh, uh, without the actual representation, is impossible to build uh, a model of the real world, uh, because uh, <laughs> I have no idea on how to do. Imagine that you are paralyzed since mm -hmm. birth. What what would be your knowledge about the world? Uh, and in order to, uh, I would uh, uh, generalize more this concept by saying that. Uh, uh, Without interaction with the environment and with the other people, we cannot create a knowledge. Mm -hmm. We just make a collection of sensations yeah. that we can uh, maybe try to put together by using some uh, uh, grammar, okay? Artificial mm -hmm. grammar of uh, hierarchy, maybe of uh, pseudo knowledge, but it's not real knowledge. And which is the problem in my view, is that uh, in both fields, uh, uh, neuroscience and robotics, people usually uh, like uh, big problems, big, big stuffs. Roboticists want to do reasoning the machines. Neuroscientists want to discuss about theory of mind. And this is the epity to me, because uh, without a reductionist approach, without a minimalist approach, uh, without a humility, okay, you can build anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing, sorry. You can build nothing because... Uh, you cannot start from, uh, let's say, uh, an interacting speaking robot uh, without having before a lot of uh, 
knowledge about the bricks which form which form this. Uh, I was discussing, I remember I was discussing with uh, Itziar Laka years ago, you both, uh, Katerina and Jan, also, also Julio know her. She's a brilliant uh, scientist, uh, but she's completely Chomskyan. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, big discussions, both in private and public lives. And uh, I remember that the one point I was raising with her is that why should we discuss about uh, special uh, uh, property of language without taking into consideration uh, the, a sort of co-development of the motor system. It's impossible to me to imagine that uh, the two mm -hmm. systems develop uh, asynchronously. And I uh, was uh, joking and proposing, let's start to try to write a sort of grammar for Australopithec. I imagine uh, the birth of language, okay? And uh, which are the, the, the very basic ingredient uh, that may allow us, no, allow them to build, to write a grammar book, textbook. Uh, in my view, these elements are almost all sensory motor. And the key point to mm -hmm. me, for example, would be to study from uh, both perspectives, so computational and the neuroscientists, how to put in the framework elements which are not clearly or immediately sensory motor, like adverbs, like uh, later or before or uh, far and no far and close is pretty sensory motor as well mm -hmm. so i would start again from this very basic uh, ground otherwise uh, it, it remains a dream the integration between neuroscience and robotics maybe i'm, yeah. I'm wrong but this is just my my opinion mm. i absolutely agree i absolutely agree and uh, there is a, a myth in language as well uh, people believe that all words uh, are referential, they refer to something, but there are words that do exactly what you say, they, uh, they may be dictic, for example, they are like operators, so they do not refer to objects, actions or whatever, but they refer to some processes, okay, so dictic words uh, are, an, are an example of this. Uh, this, that, you know, they don't have meaning on their own, but they perform a function which is labeled and uh, symbolized, okay? So I agree, if we go down to analyzing exactly how language is used, uh, how different parts of speech are being used, then uh, we get a different picture from uh, what is the common understanding of uh, the role of language. I totally agree. And regarding what Yanis said, Yanis, um, what you described with um, the, the use of data in robotics so that a, a robot learns everything, it reminds me of uh, what is happening in the field of language analysis in natural language processing. We have exactly the same problem uh, in the sense, sense that people uh, believe that by crunching huge amounts of data, they will uh, manage to, um, uh, to create meaning, to understand what uh, people say and what people mean. Uh, but it hasn't happened, it can't happen that way. And um, my, uh, my position is that we need to know how humans use basic cognitive uh, processes uh, to structure the world that they perceive, that they act upon, uh, they probably use the same processes to structure the information they uh, they get, the things that they learn, the the way they encode their memories of the world and their actions in the world. Luciano, we don't hear you. You're muted. Caterina, this is one of the mm -hmm. reasons why I always appreciated a lot. I was involved since the beginning in the RoboCab project. So the idea by Giulio. Uh, and Giorgio and the others, but mainly by Giulio at the beginning, to build a, a developing, a, a baby robot. A yeah. baby, okay, this is very funny and uh, seductive and so on, but this is not the reason why mm -hmm. uh, was done this. The, the reason was to, to build a robot with a body, with a complex body. Yes. And the complexity of the body yeah. is a prerequisite for, a, not complex, but at least a, a starting in complexity cognition and uh, in my view um, unfortunately we didn't go ahead in the in the right direction because of many reasons but uh, uh, we have to start by thinking again to this ontogenetic uh, approach which is the winning one in my view 
Uh, and uh, if we have a baby robot, we can really simulate uh, what happens during ontogenesis. Mm? Uh, this is the reason why we interacted a lot with the Clive von Ofsten. I'm not making a myth of the past. Uh, it's a sort of abortion. It's a sort of uh, aborted uh, uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is the reason why I feel a little bit, uh, a little bit, how to say, uh, depressed for that, because uh, the starting point was uh, really very, very good and a little bit heroic. And then we we did other things. Maybe it's time now to recollect uh, some idea and uh, start again with the Julio. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know that's. Uh... Yeah, that's the in fact uh, you know the hope with these ICOV initiatives. That that's uh, trying to because I agree with you that uh, we need to think about minimalistic things and as uh, as also Yanis mentioned before. But we need to 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 be minimalistic, but looking at the, at the big issue, because otherwise we end up solving. Uh, uh, maybe interesting problems, but but without uh, you know without generalizing somehow you know yes yes yes, yes. yeah think, you know like like a, a roboticist you know the, uh, trying to design a robot which jumps higher than all the others you know these kind of things is not what we want so that that uh, but I, I agree with you that uh, we need uh, we need to start. Uh, I think this is the reason why your idea of the a, a, a small robot with a lot of degrees of freedom was a good platform. Yes, uh, you, need, you need complexity at that level because yes. otherwise you end up uh, you end up solving interesting problems, but but uh, you know not uh, advancing you know the field. Now, in this sense, mm -hmm. Valentino Breitenberg, uh, uh, small cars were already at the top level in terms of intelligence but it, the complexity was very, very low. So yeah. it was the demonstration that after that, you have to stop. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing we need to avoid is to think about uh, repeating with robots experiments that have been done with uh, humans and children. You know, yes. this uh, just demonstrated that you can describe a paper by writing a program for a robot. It doesn't uh, doesn't advance knowledge at all, and and unfortunately, developmental robotics is uh, is full of examples like this. You know that uh, you know the, are apparent and attracts uh, media, mm -hmm. but, but at the end of the day, it's just a demonstration that you can program a robot. Yes, there is a raised hand. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, it's me. Uh, I want to ask: Is there is there gonna be a recording of this? Yes, yes, we record yes. the whole session. Yeah, the event so, is being recorded. So you you will send us some link. It will yes. be on YouTube. Okay. Uh, it will be. A, I mean, it will be for sure on YouTube, and then also uh, Katerina may um, upload it on the Poeticon webpage. Uh, speaking of that, I think that. For the recording, I will end it now because I had to go eight minutes ago and it needs to process on my computer. But so sure. the call can continue. I will transfer the host to Katerina so you, you all can continue on the discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Anna.